On Zoom, we can see you, and uh, we know that you're there to be publicly recognized here in a little bit. Just know that we're having just a little bit of technical difficulties and waiting for one other director to join us, and then we'll get started. Oh, there she is. John Shore is there. So all is well, and we can get started. So I'm officially calling to order this meeting of the Board of Education for January 5th at 6.05. We'll begin with roll call. Director Chancho Shore. Director Chancho Shore, can you hear me? Not yet. I don't think she. Director Chancho Shore, if you can hear me, can you give me a thumbs up? Not looking good. Yeah, we're going to text and see if we can get Chancho Shore. Chancho Shore, can you hear me yet? One more time for Director Chancho Shore. Okay. Director Chancha Shore, test, test. Can you hear us? I can hear you now. You can hear us now. Yay. All right. We're going to do roll call. Director Chancha Shore, are you here? I am here. All right. Director Graziano will be joining us um, in a few moments. He's on his way from the airport, um, so he's temporarily absent. Director Hansen. Here. Director Holtzman. Here. Director Lung. Here. Director Meek. Here. And Director Ray is here. Please join me as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, Happy New Year to everyone. This is our first board meeting for the 2021 school year. Looking forward to our tonight's agenda with lots of great topics, but we always enjoy this first part the most, and that is a time to recognize our, our staff and students. So interim superintendent, Mr. Wise, will will give it to you. Well, first off, good evening, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, this is our first board meeting of 2021, and uh, what a great way to start with celebrations. Uh, you know, as we think about uh, the work that happens, some of the celebrations tonight are of an individual, but then also a collective group. And what starts at one time frame and makes a difference later on is a, a little bit of a theme as we talk about all of this. Um, you know, as I, as I think about uh, what we're gonna talk about first and, and a student, and when you talk about talent, and putting that talent together and the support that happens, uh, not only with that individual, but with parents and, and teachers, and uh, ran through middle school. I want to take a second and just say, Colton Pfaff, you recently won first place in the Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented Art Contest at the middle school division. I want to see if we can get Colton's work up on the screen uh, to kind of share a little bit of what he's done. You know, Colton's on the line with us, and I want you to speak a second, uh, Colton, and think about really, what's this mean to you? How, where'd you get the talent? What do you feel when you create this? And then, you know, it's not too often you get, a, get awards and recognition for it. You know, tell us a little bit about uh, what inspired you and, and where you are now and what you're thinking and how you feel. So, Colton, are you with us? And uh, would you like to share a little more for us? Uh, yeah, I'm right here. Thank you for having me tonight. So, Colton, this is pretty amazing. Uh, tell us more about what sparked, when, when you started to have a love for art, what sparked this? And tell us more about what you've done. Um, so I started art, uh, probably four or five years ago, but it was like only small drawings. Um, and then I started to go on YouTube and I got more involved into it. And I found this, um, the style that I do right now, which is called doodling. And that's what you see on the screen. It's all these little different things combined into one big art piece. And I just love this, the creativity in it and how it all flows and is very pleasing to the eye. And I always like to incorporate a lot of um, very bright colors to make it eye popping. And 
I just really like this style and I'm happy with how it turned out. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's neat to hear not only uh, your technical aspects of your style and what inspired you, but also um, what you get out of it. What, what do you want to do with art in the future? Um, I actually don't know. I, it's more of a hobby right now that I, re I really enjoy it. Um, I could see myself going into like graphic design or something like that. Um, illustrator. Uh, maybe an illustrator or cartoonist um, because this style is very cartoony. Uh, but I can also draw realism as you see in the middle with the eyes. Um, that's because I used to draw realism. That used to be my um, my main style that I really enjoyed. Um, and then I found this guy on YouTube who combined both of them and I thought that was really cool. So that kind of inspired this kind of art piece right here. That's awesome. Um, just to listen to you and how you talk about what might come and the technical side on, on top of everything. Uh, I want to bring in your principal, Mrs. Kylo. Uh, you also have on the line uh, Ms. Irwin, Irvin and Ms. Rothwell. If you would, will you share a little bit about uh, Colton and the work and, and the difference, uh, you know, where you see recognition like this and that partnership at school? I would love to. Thanks for having us here tonight. Um, Colton, first, we are so proud of you. He's a seventh grader at Ranchview and he's on the gray team. We're proud of him and his artistic abilities, but more importantly, even we're proud of that he's just a really kind human being. And you could tell that just from listening to him talk right there. Colton, I had your teachers tell me a little bit about you in your classroom, and here's what they had to say, that you're funny and that you have a great personality. Ms. Bocci says that you're thoughtful in your classroom interactions and you're just a kind human being. And Ms. Boyd says you're a warm and friendly person with an open heart and a great attitude and that you're enthusiastic and you incorporate that impressive art talent into almost all of your projects and assignments. So congratulations and keep following those passions and dreams that you have because you are a very talented young boy. So congratulations, we're so very proud of you. Thank you so much, that means a lot to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would like to jump in too. Um, I'm the facilitator of the gifted program at Ranchview. And Colton, we are so incredibly proud of you and grateful that you share your talent with everybody. And we're also grateful that we have the electives in the arts that you're taking advantage of right now to help develop your talent. Um, I also wanna shout out thanks to Allison Rothwell, who was the, who is the gifted facilitator at Roxborough. And she's actually the one who reached out to Colton about the contest in fall when I barely knew him, but she knew him so well. And I think it's just a great example of the continuity of care that our students get going from one grade to another and one school to another. So um, I, I want to give her my thanks too. Mr. Roswell, would you like to say anything? Yeah, yeah um, I just, um, we're, we're so proud of you, Colton. Um, you, you know, four years at Roxborough Intermediate and um, the walls in our school were filled with your artwork and um, most memorably, the talent shows with your choreography. Um, even one day, he stopped me in his tracks because he had doodles all over his hand. And I was just like, what is that? And so he's always just stopped and, or he's always made me stop and just be like, wow, you know, he's just got so much talent. And, um, you know, we were, we're just so proud of you. We were able to take him through the process of uh, identification last year for gifted and talented in both visual arts and creative and productive thinking. And um, it's just so awesome to, to, to see this and to see you and to see that you're recognized. And we're just excited to see um, where this goes and how you can continue to develop your talents through classes and through just your just hobby. So awesome job. We're very proud of you. We miss you. Thank you. I miss you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Golden, it's pretty cool to hear more about you and you think about your impact at Roxboro to Ranchview and moving up the, the line within the Thunder Ridge feeder. Who's behind you? Who do you have with you? Uh, this is my mom. <laughs> Hi. It's awesome. Um, we're very proud of him. And then his little brother just ran away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that one. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, thanks for taking the time tonight. Congratulations. Great job. Keep it up, and uh, we look forward to seeing what you do in the future. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you so much. So much. Thank Thanks you. for everything you do for Colton and all the kids. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
All right. You know, uh, as we think about that, we also want to look at uh, what gets started at times. And even when you don't see it right away, but you see what pays off over the future. We're going to honor a school, school community that went above and beyond. They wanted to, to make sure that all of their students could enjoy their playground and how they could improve what they have uh, to make sure that everyone had that opportunity. It all began a couple of years ago when then sixth grader Julia Wilsh approached her teacher and principal about the need for an ADA friendly playground. This past November, her dream became a reality. On the line, we have uh, Principal Katie Lynch, and you have a group of you uh, from, uh, from over there. And, and if you would talk a little bit, Katie, about uh, the impact uh, that Julia had in starting this and where you are now and the impact for your community and your school and all of your students. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. I'm just honored um, to present some amazing individuals tonight. It really started um, with Julia, who is a student in a wheelchair, who was having a hard time kind of racing across the playground to keep up with her friends while they were playing groundsies and things like that. And so um, Ms. Kreinbrink is on here. She's our OT. And Mr. Crystal is on here as well. He's our um, learning specialist. And they really listened to Julia. It was about um, a student just um, talking about what they needed, and they listened. And and then they let her find her voice. You know, it can be kind of scary, especially with Principal Lynch. I'm really scary. So to come to the office and have to talk to me, um, you know, about something like a playground or what could we do with it um, was was kind of overwhelming. So Julia um, got together with some of her friends. So you'll see some friends on here. Um, we have um, Alexis Fritz. She's here in her Riel shirt. You can wave Alexis so they can see you. Um, we have Zach Brawler. He's in here as well. And then we have Amelia Neckvassil. And um, th so the four of them started coming to my office and Mrs. Kreinberg and Mr. Crystal would talk to him about like the next steps of what we could talk about. And it really started with um, some basic um, games that they could play and it wound up being a ADA friendly, not just an ADA compliant, but an ADA friendly uh, playground that two years later, um, all students can enjoy. That's terrific. And is Julia uh, here with us also? She said she was going to get on and I, um, I'm looking for her and I don't see her um, on here. Yeah, I don't see her yet either. Um, Zach and Alexis are very proficient in the playground and talking um, on camera, so I'm sure you could ask either one of them questions and they'd be happy to answer. Perfect. Uh, so let's start with both of you. And, and maybe, oh. hey, there's Julia. You know what? Yeah, there's Julia. Zach and Alexis, we'll come back to you. Julia, welcome. Um, first off, to take an idea and move it forward and advocate and make things happen, how does it feel to see this come to fruition? And, and uh, you know, what, what, are you, what are you thinking? <laughs> what are you thinking? Uh, you go ahead. Uh, excited? Yeah. <laughs> she didn't know Sorry. she'd have to talk. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Yep. It is. What uh? What are you proud of with this uh, new ADA friendly playground and the opportunity it has? This isn't even for you. This is about for everyone else. The difference you made for others. What makes you proud with that? That uh, other people will be able to use it in the future. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, when you do something and it's more about others than yourself, the maturity and the, the heart and the passion for that really, I think, speaks to everybody. You see everybody smiling on the screen. Um, and all the people that will come through Northridge and be able to experience what you helped create. Um, is pretty darn amazing. So I'm, I just want you to know how appreciative we all are, uh, speaking for the board and, and all of Douglas County, and then specifically let some of your uh, teachers and students talk also. Um, what would you want others to be able to do at Northridge and a part of this playground? What would you hope for? Um, for everyone to be included. Nice. Nice. Julia, who do you have here with you? Who's with you tonight? Oh, okay. mom. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Love your smiles together. Uh, congratulations. We're proud of you. And, and I want to ask uh, 
Principal Lynch, if she can also introduce Zach and Alexis and, and also talk about that partnership. You know, when friendships and people come together and do that work, it says a lot. So, uh, Katie, if you'll do that to introduce Zach and Alexis, and we'll get a few more comments and then finish up the, the celebration of you, Julie, and your accomplishments. For sure. It, it goes back to just being good human beings. And both Alexis and Zach and Amelia, I know you're on here somewhere, um, are just amazing people. And so when they came to my office, um, they rose to the challenge. What would you guys say was the best part of um, building this playground? I think the best part was being able to play together and finally include Julia with everything. Zach, what about you? Zach, you're still muted. If you click on that microphone, if you want to say something. I think he's having a hard time. If he starts talking, I'll stop. But um, we were able to do a, um, a DCSD story and everyone came back and Julia was beating them up the ramp and um, was able to transfer from her chair to um, a lot of the apparatuses and play with kids and not just stare at them playing. Um, and for me to see that light, that light in Julia's face and her eyes, um, it was it's something I, I didn't go to college to be a playground builder. And I'll tell you, it's been the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Yeah. Well, I just, Julie, anything else you want to add? Or Zach, I don't know if you want to come back on, but Julie, anything else you want to add as I close uh, this part out? Um, I, I, <laughs> not. Not really. Well, what we talk about with Julia is uh, one small voice can make a big difference. That is terrific. You know what? I don't think I could say anything better. What a testament, Julia, to you, um, your thoughtfulness, your advocation, your work, to your friends and, and teachers and principals uh, uh, that helped make this happen. And just want to say thank you. Thank you uh, to all of you and the Northridge community. What a great accomplishment that's going to be an uh, uh, impact to so many in the future. So um, appreciate you all. Congratulations. How about a round of applause for Julie and the Northridge community? All right. Hey, last but not least, the Colorado Association of School Boards designated January as a month of appreciation for um, our school board and all the school boards in Colorado. And I want to take a moment just to personally say, you know, when you think about um, serving and you think about taking on challenging topics and you think about the time to not only be in these meetings and lead, set a vision and governance, but also the time away from your families, uh, Douglas County School District would like to say thank you and we appreciate you. And we've compiled a little video uh, that represents uh, um, a collective voice of the impact that you make, just to say appreciation no matter um, what the topic is, what the time is, what the challenge or the celebration, but to serve and to lead a school district in, in the most honoring profession and probably most meaningful profession, thank you for what you do and the time that you spend. Chris, if you'll get us started, please. Good evening, it's Corey Wise, Interim Superintendent of the Douglas County School District. It's January, 2021, Happy New Year. But January is also the Board Appreciation Month. You know, when we think about the Board of Education, we don't always realize that while they're elected officials, it's a volunteer job. They don't get paid, but they spend countless hours planning for these meetings, uh, setting up committees and being a part of committees, and really setting up the policy governance that helps Douglas County be the great school district for every employee and student. I wanna take this time just to say thank you. I and we appreciate you, and we couldn't do without you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Douglas County School District Board of Education for their dedication and hard work in supporting our students and staff, not only at Eagle Academy, but the Douglas County School District as a whole. Hey, who would have ever thought that as you demonstrated interest in becoming a board member and ran for election, that we would have ever faced the challenges that you're facing today uh, with COVID and superintendent searches. Um, I just wanna let you know that we really appreciate everything you're doing and your advocacy for our students, for our community, 
and for our entire school district. I just want to say thank you for all your support for all Douglas County students throughout this school year. And I especially want to say thank you for all your support in getting us our new space and our new building. It is truly appreciated. We know that you do this out of the goodness of your heart and out of your love for, for students and for education. And we just want to say thank you. It warms my heart to know we are supported by such an outstanding team. You work uh, long nights and long days, put in a lot of hours for the students and staff in Douglas County. So thank you for all your hard work. For all the things you do for our kids on a daily basis, we are beyond appreciative. You really make a Douglas County a great place to work and learn. It's very obvious, not only in board meetings, but also just the way that you communicate on all levels, how much you care about educators. Wanting to thank you both as an educator and as a parent for your passion and your dedication and commitment to students, families, and staff. As a principal, we have felt the board's support throughout um, the last several years, particularly this year, and I just can't even imagine the amount of pressure that you are all under um, to support constituents and keep our kids back to school, which I know you all want to do. I know it's a thankless job sometimes, and I know that you folks work hard every single day and think of every single permutation in order to make sure that your students and staff are safe. On behalf of Summit View Elementary, I would just like to say thank you to our board of directors for all of their hard work and continued support. You have committed yourselves to this school district. You have served this school district and we appreciate you more than you know. Thank you for all you guys do. There's been many tough decisions um, and many late nights I know you guys have had in your meetings um, over this past year. Um, but thank you for all your support for our students, our community, and our school district. Legacy Point Elementary wants to thank you, the Board of Education, for all of your efforts over the last 10 months and continuing. We cannot thank you enough. You've allowed us to come together as a school community and uh, work together and learn together in smart and healthy ways. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to the Douglas County School District Board of Education for showing tremendous leadership in the face of tremendous adversity this year. We are so grateful for your leadership and that you're always putting students and staff and families safety at the forefront. So thank you truly for everything that you've done. To ensure that we are providing the very best education, not only through academics, but also social emotional learning for all of our students and our staff. So thank you guys so much for all of your work. We love you and we appreciate you. The work is difficult and the load is heavy and you do it every day with grace. You are incredible and I am forever grateful for you and your hard work. Thanks for all you do for our district. You guys always go above and beyond. You work enormous amount of hours. And again, I am just so appreciative of everything you do. I appreciate everything that you guys have done and given us as staff members and as our community. Thank you, Board of Education. My name is Carson from Lowell from Cashwalk Elementary. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for all of the hard work that you put into supporting us this school year. Just wanted to say a huge thank you so much. Thank you for all you do for our students across the district. Uh, this has been a very uh, interesting year and I appreciate all of the support that you've given to all of the employees that uh, in throughout the district so thank you and I hope you have a wonderful holiday. Thanks so much for everything that you've done for us. For all of our students and for us teachers we appreciate you. Thank you so much for all you are doing you are so appreciated. To do this during a pandemic requires great grit and determination and we are so thankful for all that you do. It is a thankless job but we thank you. Thank you for all you do for our school district and for the staff. I'm here with my buddy Blaze and we just wanted to wish you a happy holiday season and thank you for all of the support on behalf of all of our little buffaloes at Frontier Valley. Both as a mom and as a principal, I appreciate all the hard work, dedication that you do on a daily basis. Um, it's a thankless job, I know that. So I just want you to know from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you. Thank you for all that you're doing. You make Douglas County a good place for staff, students, and families. I just wanted to give you a big shout out and thank you for all you have done this school year to help us stay safe and keep learning moving forward. Thank you for your outside the box thinking. Because you really have taken care of all kids and that you've given this opportunity 
to expand our work in equity, but also have shown a, a consistent history of taking care of the most historically marginalized kids. And I've never felt more supported by another board. You are not only present, but participants and um, your insights and and knowledge and, and participation is so appreciated. And this has been quite a year with many, many changes. Thank you for all of the support you have given to us and for always having the backs of the classroom teachers. On behalf of all the teachers and as a parent, I want to thank everyone on the board for all of your hard work. And on behalf of our school community, I want to say thank you to our school board for helping us navigate through this crazy year. Uh, there's been a lot to a lot of challenges and a lot of changes throughout the entire year. And you've certainly helped us keep everybody in the school as much as possible. And we really do appreciate it. Well, so I looked up in the, uh, the dictionary, the most thankless volunteer job on the planet and I found you which is ridiculous because nobody gives more time energy and effort to doing right by our kids than you guys do and uh, it certainly goes uh, it needs to be mentioned and I thank you I appreciate you thanks for doing what you're doing thanks for advocating for our kids in our community Buffalo Ridge Elementary administration staff students and community would like to thank the Douglas County School District Board of Education for their tireless efforts in supporting us and doing what we love. Learning, teaching, and growing. You have spent hours listening to us. You have spent hours worrying about us. You have spent hours coming up with a plan to help us succeed. From our BRE home to yours. Thank you for everything you have done that we know about. Everything you have done that we don't know about and everything you still plan to do for our families. We appreciate you. I certainly hope that during this break that we had that you just spent time loving on your own families. And have a beautiful holiday season. And wish you a wonderful winter break and a happy new year. From me, Mountain Vista staff and our school community, uh, thanks for everything you do for us. Really appreciate you. Happy new year and here's to an awesome 2021. Here's to a much different 2021 here's to 2021 and and hopefully uh some some things are on the rise and it's going to be a, a better year and um and your continued leadership is going to continue to guide us good evening it's corey wise interim superintendent of the douglas county school district it's january the impact you make you look at the number of people um, that represents our entire school district and not only as a staff, but also parents, community. Um, we appreciate you. We appreciate your service. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. My goodness. Um, <laughs> we may need that video a few more times throughout the year. Just <laughs> oh, well done. Thank you. I, I don't know what else to say. Just thank you. And I know I speak for all of us that it, um, that we do this because of Miss Julia right there that's still on, on the Zoom with us. That's, that's why we do this. And, um, but certainly those words of affirmation uh, go right to the heart. So thank you for developing the video. Thank you for all that participated. In, and um, all right, let's get to work. <laughs> Enough of that. All right. Um, board, next on our agenda is the acceptance of the agenda. Is there a motion? Move to accept the agenda. Second. Second. Mo motion made by Meek, seconded by Holtzman. Let's go ahead and vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. That passes unanimously. Next on our agenda is public comment. The board values hearing diverse viewpoints from a broad spectrum of citizens throughout our community, specifically for items it listed. It looks like no one else is going to join this call. I don't know where Goodbye. that came from. But we'll continue to say that we look forward to hearing from our public commenters tonight. Two policies guide how public comment to the board is received, board policy KE, public complaints, and board policy BEDH, public participation at board meetings. Policy BEDH explains that since the board's responsibility is setting policy for the school district, members of the public should direct their comments to policy matters. 
Board Policy KE further outlines the process for responding to grievances and complaints, believing that these are best handled and resolved as close to the origin of concern as possible. Therefore, we encourage the proper channeling of concerns. For example, concerns that involve a child should begin with the teacher, then the building administrator, then the director of schools, assistant superintendent, and superintendent before appealing to the Board of Education. As has always been our practice, those wanting to make public comment are requested to complete an online form prior to three o'clock of the meeting. Those who are signed up by this time received an email with directions for calling in. Given the format of this meeting, there are some additional directions I would like to provide. First of all, once you have called in, if you are signed up to be a public commenter, your phone will be muted until your name is called. You will be able to listen to the meeting by your phone, but not able to speak. Please make sure that you are not running the meeting on a computer in the background and that you are in a quiet environment. Keep in mind that the meeting broadcasted on YouTube is slightly delayed, so it's best to only listen to the meeting on your phone. Once I call your name, please uh, respond, state your name, and acknowledge um, and, and wait to be acknowledged that you can be heard. I would remind commenters we want to continue to maintain a decorum of mutual respect and would ask that speakers refrain from using individual names in an offensive manner as this only distracts from the issue of concern. The board does follow Robert's rules of orders to guide it in participating in an orderly and fairly conducted meeting. Under those rules, if a director calls for a point of order, all discussions and comments should stop so that a determination can be made as to whether a procedural rule or board policy has been violated. Therefore, if a point of order is made while public comments are being made or if I interrupt you, the speaker should pause until otherwise directed to continue. The speaker's phone will be muted until asked to continue. Each speaker tonight is allotted up to three minutes to address the board. You will hear bell tones signaling that this is the end of that time. If for some reason you get dis disconnected or have difficulty getting on, please email Sandy Marsh. Uh, she's the one that sent you the original email regarding how to link on. Uh, she is uh, monitoring her email tonight, so if there's something that happens, please contact her. Please know that this is our time to just listen without engaging in discussion. However, please also know your comments will certainly be considered as the board continues its work tonight. So we will now proceed with public comment. Our first caller is Sarah Perez. After Sarah is Jennifer Iverson and Jody Womack. Sarah Perez, are you on the line? This is Jennifer Iverson. I heard you, Jennifer. I'm just, I'm going to pause for just a second. Is Sarah Perez on the line? Not hearing Sarah? Jennifer Iverson, please go ahead. Good evening. All right. Thank you. Um, in early October of this school year, I came before this board, cabinet, and interim superintendent to plead for many students who could not get to their school because of the changes in the transportation policy. The families had chosen hybrid for their children, but had not been able to get to their school since August. In November, DCSD's Department of Transportation met with several school accountability committees to brainstorm and it could be available to other children. Students who have qualified for the hardship clause, no feasible way of physically getting to school safely, in the current DCSD transportation policy, are still not able to get to their classes because of unused or underused smart tax. This is a community effort and the actions we take, we decide to take, can show our neighbors that we do care for them and their children. If our community can reduce the number of underused and unused smart tags, it could make a huge difference in the lives and education of DCSD students still unable to attend in-person classes due to busing restrictions. So if your student has not used or is not intending to use their smart tag for busing this semester, please let go of that reserve seat for a student who needs that ride to access their education. Thank you from the, from the Acres Green Elementary SAC, the Crest Hill Middle School SAC, and the Highlands Ranch Middle, excuse me, <laughs> and the Highlands Ranch High School SAC. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Iverson. Jody Womack is next, and then after Jody is Katie Kane, and then Allison Kalinske. Jody, are you there?
Okay, one more call for Jody Womack. Okay, moving on to Katie Kane. Are you there? I'm sorry, I am here. This is Jody Womack. Yes. Oh, good. Just okay. in the nick of time, Jody. <laughs> Go sorry, ahead. I could not find the button to do it. I'm technologically <laughs> No worries, no worries. Go ahead. Good evening. Good morning. Thank goodness. Good evening. Hi. First and foremost, I want to thank all of you, especially after that video, Hello. all the administrators, teachers, secretaries. Can you hear me? Okay. And everyone in education for doing what you do. You all are essential, and I'm thankful my kids are in a great school system. My name is Jody Womack, and I'm a parent of four boys who have attended or are attending Douglas County Schools. Specifically, I, have a, I work in a NICU. Well, I don't work in a cave and keeping everybody happy and, um, and, and the, the laws that are preventing us from going to, to full in person. But both my boys, both my high school boys who have ADHD and are very bright are now struggling with depression and anxiety because they do not have the structure and relationships that come with in-person learning. And I know I'm not unique to this. Um, this year has been an absolute disaster for both of them. I know you're aware of the struggles they're having and there are those of us who are fortunate and can have tutors or hire tutors, counselors, and et cetera. And then there are some who have quit their jobs to help their kids emotionally and cognitively through this pandemic. I know both the board and the governor want to see in-person learning return. However, up to November, the obstacles have primarily, in my eyes, um, have been the quarantine rules. And this brings me to some questions and possible solutions. <clears throat> And I emailed this to Corey Weiss. So Corey, I'm sorry you're hearing this again if this is a second time. But first of all, I wanna know if the teachers have been polled about what environment they feel comfortable teaching, whether it's in person versus hybrid versus remote learning. It would be great for those numbers to at least be transparent or at least available. I have several friends and it's not for a blame game. It's more for just to find out the statistics. I have several friends who are teachers and have told me how awful this is for them. I can't imagine that. The time they're spending more time than ever than planning, engaging lessons for students who are not engaged due to this e-learning and hybrid schedules. I know there are rumors flying around about litigation fears. And while I see that as a healthy fear, have you considered having parents sign a contract saying no litigious, or quote, I'm not a lawyer, no litigious action will occur if their child should contact, contact COVID while at school. Second, I'd love to know what the transmission rate is for teachers and students who have tested positive and contracted it from the school setting in Douglas County. According to the World Health Organization, and I quote, children in schools are unlikely to be the main drivers of COVID-19 transmission. Community transmission is low and appropriate measures are applied. Oh, which is completely understandable to all the remote, to going all remote during November and December with the rising numbers of cases in the community. Can I continue one last paragraph? Yes, go ahead, Ms. Womack. Okay, thank you, I'm sorry. I timed myself earlier, but another problem prior to November, and this is the most important takeaway, was that the exposure guidelines are too stringent. I know your hands are tied, but our neighboring states, such as Nebraska and Utah, as well as other states are able to maintain in-person learning by utilizing masks, which we all know is required in the state. For example, if a child tests positive, who is wearing a mask and all the close contacts, i.e. the teachers and the other students are wearing masks, only the positive person isolates and the others self monitor. I know that many students and teachers were quarantined just because of exposure, but never tested positive. I would like to ask if we can somehow parents, the board, whoever you need to put pressure on the governing bodies to change the exposure and quarantine guidelines like so many states have already. Will you please listen to the teachers, students, and parents and pursue, even in the secondary schools and other metro areas, how they're able to keep their students in the classroom five days a week? Very good. Thank and you, as Ms. you know, with the vaccinations coming to fruition and the decrease in the number of cases, we just need to be more proactive, proactive in getting back to the in-person learning. And I know you know that according to the CDC, quote and unquote, during weeks 12 to 42 of 2020, the proportion of mental health related visits for children aged 5 to 11 years and adolescents aged 12 to 17 years increased approximately 24% and 31% respectively compared to those in 2019. And this is for a virus that kills less than 1.2% of all age groups. Very good. So with proper guidelines and safety precautions, we can and need to get our children back in the classroom. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Womack. 
Katie Kane is next, Allison Kulinski, and then Taylor Short is Katie Kane on. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Kane, please go ahead. Great. Hi, Happy New Year. Um, thank you for your decision to return elementary students back to in-person learning. I also appreciate Superintendent Wise's commitment to not have a district-wide shutdown again this year. That said, I want to revisit a question President Ray proposed during a December meeting. If children are not getting COVID at school and not later becoming infected during quarantine, why are we even quarantining? Research at Ohio State University asked the same question and conducted a study to find the answer. Not surprisingly, the study found that there was no difference in the infection rate of students who were in close contact with a student who had tested positive for the virus and those who were not exposed. We all know that schools are safe. We know that teachers are not at any greater risk than other essential workers. And now um, we'll be getting the vaccine here shortly. The main reason we shut down in December was the inability to remain staffed with the quarantine procedures. It's also the reason middle and high school students are not in person at this time. I'm thrilled that my own elementary kids are back in school, but I know that at any moment they could be subject to a meaningless quarantine and be back learning at home. And I also feel deeply for the children, the older children that are stuck at home as the last caller talked about. I urge you to review the data from the Ohio State study and seek to ver further amend the quarantine procedures with the CDPHE. They've gotten better, but it's still not enough. Ohio and many other states have adopted this change and are eliminating quarantine at schools. We still have five months left of the school year. Let's make the most of it and keep our kids in the classroom as long as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kane. Allison Kalinske, Taylor Short, and then Joel Chambers. Allison Kalinske, are you there? One more call for Allison Kalinsky. Okay, moving on to Taylor Short. Taylor Short, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Short, please go ahead. Great, thank you for your time. My name is Taylor Short and my son attends Mountain Ridge Middle School. I'm here today to um, urge the board to push to reopen in-person school for all ages as soon as possible. I would also like to extend my gratitude for all of the endless work that you have been doing throughout this whole pandemic. I do believe us as adults who have a voice and a say have a responsibility to look out and stand up for our kids as I know that each and every one of you do all day, every day. There are endless points to be made here, but to highlight a few in order of, important, of importance. Number one, the death rate amongst our children is zero. It's not even a thousandth of a percentage point. Number two, this virus is not going anywhere. There will continue to be illnesses that arise and locking down and hiding from them is not the answer. Number three, we are seeing increased mental health struggles in our children, increased suicides, Nationwide, one in four youth have reported seriously considering taking their lives. Suicide rates and drug overdose rates in high school students have now surpassed COVID deaths for them. Number four, the detriment that we are doing to our children long-term, time will only tell. They are falling significantly behind in school, social skills, and spending all day on a screen. And the last point I have, number five, is we really need to stand up for our children. They cannot stand up and use their voices yet. There is no end to this in sight and we simply must get them back in school now. Thank you so much for your time. As a teacher or in another capacity, if, they're not feel, if they don't feel comfortable, your job as a board of education is to put the, the, the opportunity there for the teachers to teach and the students to learn. They are not getting that opportunity right now. And it's horrible. And as, you, as your seats come up for re-election, we will be remembering this. You, you guys have done a huge disservice to the students who need in-person learning. Other districts are able to do this. Private schools are able to do this. Charter schools are able to do this. Humble yourselves, investigate what they're doing to be able to do it, and do that for our students. There are schools 
within less of a mile of our schools that are able to teach their students. There's no reason that Douglas County School District should not be serving the students that they work for. So I ask you tonight, as you talk again, please stop creating problems that you can't fix. The quarantining has been fixed. The state has said schools are essential. This is a problem that you guys can fix. You have the ability to do it tonight to send our kids back to school next week. They are ready to go back. They need to go back. They're suffering. There's high school students and middle school students. Suicide rates have gone through the roof. Hospital beds are full of mental patients because of this, of what's happening in our schools. And you guys have the ability to change that. So I'm asking you to please, as you talk tonight, listen to these parents that are asking you, begging you, coming on week after week to say, please give our kids the option. We're not forcing everyone to go. Just give us the option. And that's your job to provide that education. And it can only be provided in person for many, many students. So please, I implore you tonight, as you talk into the night, to please send our kids back to school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chambers. Christopher Ryman is next, Mike Stern and Nate Ormond. Uh, Christopher Ryman, are you there? <laughs> yes, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Ryman, please go ahead. Thank you for taking my comment. Um, I wanted to say that I know my kids were really excited to get back to school this week after break. I know that there have been many difficulties with staffing and substitute teachers, among many other items with opening the schools. As you know, this is very challenging for students and parents to have inconsistency in the education and schedule. I appreciate that we are getting the elementary schools open for in-person learning and hopefully the rest of Douglas County School District schools. My question is, what is the plan to ensure that the schools remain open for in-person learning long-term, especially considering staffing and substitute concerns? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryman. Mike Stern is next, Nate Ormond, and then Margaret Motz. Mike Stern, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you for this opportunity. First, let me establish my perspective. I'm a teacher and a parent. As a history teacher, this past year has taught me society has no perspective on the previous pandemics or even history. There's nothing new under the sun. As Dr. Fauci stated in the New England Journal of Medicine on March 26, 2020, COVID-19 is like the 1958 and 1968 pandemics. For these two global pandemics, we did nothing beyond what we'd normally do for the flu. John Hopkins University study on November 22nd, 2020 showed COVID has relatively, quote, no effect on the deaths in the United States, but that was quickly deleted because it did not fit the media's narrative. So are we going to again cower in fear for a so-called new strain of COVID-19? I say we do what we ought to do, and that is open our schools. My question is, are we going to allow science and facts to determine policy? Ultimately, until safe means never. The so-called cure cannot be worse than the disease. In December, the CDC reported a substantial increase in fatal drug overdoses coinciding with the closures and the measures taken to control the pandemic. The U.S. has seen, quote, a substantial increase in fatal drug overdoses and set a record for deaths from those overdoses. Not to mention unemployment, suicides, alcohol abuse, domestic abuse, and child abuse. The CDC goes on to say the potential for adverse outcomes on suicide risk is very high. As a teacher and a parent, who represents me? The majority of parents want a full-time in-person school. Also, this has been the most difficult year of my 16-year teaching experience. And most of this is due to attempts to control a virus. And it really essentially is a man-made crisis. Everyone has struggled, students, teachers, and administrators, but my students have struggled the most. The measures put in place to keep us safe have done more damage than the disease. Again, perspective is critical. Everything done has hindered instruction, has hindered well-being and normalcy. I have students who are obviously depressed and struggling. Remember, this is only supposed to be two weeks. There's no there is no continuity between what we have. There is no continuity because we have a governor and an inept Department of Health who does not understand how society works and the needs of family and what normal lives and virtual learning has only hurt us. In some, these policies are destroying the lives and livelihoods. Both the CDC and the WHO have recommended opening our schools. Our schools 
and lives must return to normal. So I'm asking you, please open our schools 100%. Cases don't equal deaths. In the end, I only want what is best for my students. And I thank you guys. I know this is a very difficult time. Um, I realize that you have a diverse um, voices that you're trying to listen to and it's difficult. And I, 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 I don't, do not envy your positions, but as, as a parent and as a teacher, it's been a very, very difficult year, um, an incredibly difficult year. And that's heartbreaking. So thank, you. thank you, Mr. Stern. Nate Ormond is next. Margaret Motz, Kelly Slothalber. Nate Ormond, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you for the time. Thanks again for uh, listening to my data. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the last two meetings um, rattling off as much uh, COVID-related data as I possibly could. Well, I'll give you some of that today. I want to focus on some, um, uh, some really troubling data, some of which has already been discussed today. Um, but anyway, let's get to it. Um, I, I think if you really cared about the COVID data at this point, the kids would be in school. I, I, and, and so I'm going to bring in some additional information around that. Um, you know, I'm kind of disgusted that um, you, you guys are able to uh, at last moment change this uh, schedule um, and, and, and discontinue in person even 50% time, um, but you won't um, after a two week break. Uh, discontinue a teacher work day that was already scheduled for yesterday. I think that shows your priorities. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, some of the data around uh, the, the COVID right now is, is that zero kids in Colorado have been hospitalized under the age of 29, for crying out loud. Uh, zero deaths, obviously, they haven't been hospitalized under the age of 29. Uh, we've only got 34 total cases in all of Colorado for kids under the age of 19 years old. You've heard all of this before. Um, for whatever reason, it doesn't really resonate with you. 50% um, of the kids in Boston are not logging in. Um, uh, to their to their online learning. Um, there's an estimated 30% loss in reading skills due to online learning. Um, obviously, the social experiences, which are very critical for school. If, if all we wanted to do is have kids look up information, I just tell my kids to Google everything. Um, obviously, the social experiences are very, very important. Um, you know, we talk about uh, children. We know that they're at basically zero risk for death, zero risk for hospitalization. I know you're concerned about your teachers, overly concerned about your fearful teachers. Uh, but the, uh, there's an extremely minimal risk of actually even transmitting this disease. This is seen in data from Switzerland, Iceland, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Asia, and the United States. You can look it up yourself. Uh, kids are very extremely minimal uh, risk of even transmitting the disease uh, to even their parents. It's absolutely irrational. Um, even if you look at the data itself on teachers in the United States, uh, over half of the teachers are less than 41 years old um, and 82% are less than 55 um, uh, you know, under the age of 60, the risk of death is less than or equal to seasonal influenza. Are you implying that from now on we will shut school from November to April uh, because seasonal influenza is just as dangerous to teachers, uh, the vast majority of teachers, as seasonal influenza? Uh, we know how to mitigate risk. I assume teachers uh, know what social distancing is, and we've figured out probably how to do that in the school setting. I assume teachers know how to wear masks if they're concerned, and I assume the teachers can figure out how to teach from a distance because they're basically doing it right now. So if they're a high-risk category, we can probably figure out for those few teachers that are in that high-risk category uh, how, to, how to minimize and socially distance that. All right, enough with the COVID data uh, de directly. 200,000 uh, kids, um, uh, child abuse cases were unreported during a two month period. This is 1.2 million reported um, child abuse cases across the United States because schools are the number one place where child abuse is reported. Schools are the number one place where kids who need glasses are detected, who need hearing aids are detected. How can you claim to be so concerned about the welfare of kids and continue this policy? Um, over 35%, uh, excuse me, there was an increase, just a couple more seconds. There, the, there, there was an increase of ER visits for school-aged children up 35% due to child abuse. This is not because a parent brings their kid in because they've hit them, given them black eyes, because they think they've killed them, it's because they think they've broken their bones. It's because they're unconscious and their very survival lacks it. That's why they bring them into the emergency room. These are on your heads. This child abuse is on your heads at this point in time. I hope when your head hits your pillow tonight, you remember that at least. I'm committed to up to $100,000 of my own money to uh, launch a recall and an election effort to, to place a citizen-based board. You can contact me at nateormond at gmail.com if you're interested uh, in that with me. Thank you, Mr. Ormond. Margaret Motz is next. Kelly Slothhaber, Jamie Wooldridge. 
Margaret Motz, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Motz, please go ahead. My last name is pronounced Motes. I apologize. Ms. Motes, please That's go ahead. Right. That's okay. I am an employee of Douglas County for 30 plus years. I have been a teacher since three high schools in Rick O'Connell. I've served this district with all my heart for all those years, and I have woken up every morning glad to go to work. I love my job, I love my students, but these last few months have been hard. Um, unlike the um, statements by the previous speaker, I'm willing, I'm willing. I'll do anything to get back in the classroom with my students. Uh, I, I disagree with so many things, but that's something different. Um, I'm very proud as anybody who knows me knows to be one of the few last holders of a three digit employee hmm. number. I've heard there's only 11 other besides me. Um, I'm, your, I'm your contact person. I'm the one with your, the children every day. And I think that I have a lot of valuable input, but I felt since this whole thing began that no one is asking teachers I served on the task force this summer and I don't feel like my voice was heard one bit. The person that headed my group the first day said, turn off your mic, don't post anything in the chat and don't raise your hand. You can email me if you want. Well, that's not asking me for my input. That's not allowing me to participate. And then again, um, this, before break when the grading scale was changed. No teacher input whatsoever. I don't, I don't think it was the school board. I heard it was administrators and I talked to Corey Wise about this already, but hmm, don't, why don't you ask me? Why don't you ask me what I've done to help kids succeed instead of just lowering expectations? I spend a lot of time with kids one-on-one -on -one, and I just felt like I got a slap in the face when they changed the grading scale overnight in my grade book. I felt very violated by that. And then over break, I was contacted by two parents um, who are also friends of mine. I live in the community. My daughter went through Douglas County Schools who told me, did you see that post by David Ray? And I said, no. And I think they said it was Facebook that he posted a survey for teachers, but I'm a teacher and I never got a survey. And these parents were telling each other to fill it out, pretending that you're a teacher to put what you wanna put. I didn't get to fill it out because I don't get whatever platform he was using. Why didn't he use the district? Um, I just feel like I should be part of the discussion. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Motes, and thank you for your years of service. Kelly Sloth Albert is next, Jamie Woldridge, and then Lily Porter. Uh, Kelly, are you there? One more time for Kelly Slothauber. Sorry, yes. Can you hear me? This is Kelly. Yes, hi, Kelly. I, I apologize. I'm probably butchering your last name. My apologies. No, it's, it's totally fine. It's Slothauber, but nobody can say it right. I couldn't <laughs> either. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to... Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I want to thank you guys for the time for me to speak. My name is Kelly Slothauber, and I've written the board several times, um, and several messages have not been resp uh, no response, so please excuse my frustration, except for Mr. Long. Thank you. Um, I'm a parent of an eighth grader and a tenth grader that have been struggling with online learning. You wouldn't know this because both of these girls are honor roll students. My youngest has breakdowns every single day, and my oldest has about eight breakdowns a week of crying. They dread going to online school, and they don't feel like they're learning very much. Well, I understand that some kids do well with online learning, most parents that I've spoke to said their kids are struggling. 
we have tried to do our best for this situation, but I am done accepting the narrative that it's too hard to get our middle school and high school kids back in school. It's my job as a parent to look after the best interests of my kids. Several other states have been successful at keeping kids in school. Meanwhile, our kids are falling farther and farther behind. During hybrid, the kids learn new information only on the days that they are in person. On the days that they're home, they're supposed to get review. I calculated the days before Thanksgiving that my girls were in school last semester and it came to 18. This is very frustrating to me. While the virus can be dangerous to some, it is not for the majority of people, including our kids. What is dangerous is not having the in-person social contact that our kids need to have good mental health. I am tired of hearing people say that the mental health of our kids depends on how parents handle the situation. While I agree with this to an extent, our kids are smart and can think for themselves. I can be super positive, but I can't change the feelings of loneliness in front of the computer watching their classes. We've had several different options in our household that we have been trying to fix this with. Our youngest was very upset this past Saturday night because school is about to start and she feels so lonely in her room and can't get motivated to pay attention. I can try and sugarcoat it all I want for her, but she knows how she feels. Today, she sat with me in my home office, but now I have to get my work done while listening to her classes all day long. Our oldest also feels lonely and wants to sit with us as well. You ask our kids to be critical thinkers, and yet, as a school district, are not following your own requirements. You need to give the 85% of families that voted for in-person learning that same choice that the at-risk 100% on learning gets. If, and this is a big if, the teachers are truly scared, which my husband and I have spoke to several teachers that are not, then we need to be creative and find a way to make the teachers that are scared feel safe so they can teach our kids. I have a few thoughts on this, so if you want to contact me, feel free. Um, other states only quarantine the sick. I understand the quarantine policies in Colorado's health departments make it hard to keep the kids in school, but I'm no longer accepting this as a reason to not be in school. Several private schools, including Ballard and High, are getting it done. Why can't our school district band together with other school districts and superintendents and start pushing back on these policies that are unacceptable? I have a hard time believing that our health departments could shut down an entire school district and all of the school districts across the state if they band together. Can I have more conclusion, please? In conclusion, I'm asking that you all fight for all kids. You have an online option for those at risk. Please start fighting for the kids that so badly need in-person learning. The middle school and high school kids are vulnerable in a different way than elementary. I ask that we go back to five-day five in-person learning by January 19th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Slothalber. Jamie Wooldridge is next, Lily Porter, and then Jennifer Cartwright. Jamie Wooldridge, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Wooldridge, please go ahead. Hi, good evening, Dr. Ray and members of the board and happy 2021. Huh. Um, my name is Jamie Wooldridge. I'm a mom of four students in Douglas County Schools, one at each level, all who are missing physically attending school and learning from their teachers in person. Um, I just got done outside um, of your building participating in a rally with about 100 other concerned parents, students, and fellow educators. Um, that we're wanting to show you um, all our shared desire to return all of our kids, including middle and high schoolers, to in-person learning now. Our kids have done what we've asked of them for the last 10 months. They've followed the rules, worn their masks, they've been removed from social interaction, sports and activities, and have been isolated in their rooms and homes with the promise of a return to nor normalcy once it was safe enough to do so. Thanks to our governor's advocacy, changes from the state and Tri-County Health Departments, that time is now. Due to the strict safety protocols put in place by districts around the country, schools, as we know, are one of the safest places to be. In November, CDPHE and Tri-County Health made the changes to return to targeted contact tracing regardless of where we are on the COVID dial. This, in addition to adopting the guidance from CDC to shorten quarantine times from 14 days to 10 or seven with a negative PCR test, were key important changes that will help alleviate staffing shortages and student absences by removing crippling restrictions. Additionally, because of the abundance of free COVID testing options available, 
including Douglas County's contract with COVID Check Colorado, which you all have had since August. COVID testing is free for staff, students, and their families. Staffing sh shortages should be alleviated if schools adhere to contact tracing, enforce strict mask wearing, and be diligent about seating charts and make sure teachers are not in close contact with students for more than 15 minutes. This has been shown to be effective at our Douglas County Charter Schools who are able to be in person full time for all ages, all fall semester until Thanksgiving with little to no outbreaks. Lastly, with the news that teachers have been prioritized with the vaccine starting immediately, this and all the reasons I've stated above show why all of our kids should be in person learning at all grade levels now. Thank you for your efforts returning our elementary kids to school in person today, but please don't forget about our secondary kids. All of the necessary precautions have been put in place. Charter schools and other districts around the state with much higher incident rates have been able to stay in person. Why can't we? Douglas County, Douglas County schools should be a leader, not a follower. Please do the right thing and return all of our kids to school in person now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Wildridge. Lily Porter is next and then Jennifer Cartwright. Lily Porter, are you there? Okay, one more call for Lily Porter. All right, Jennifer Cartwright, are you there? Yes, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Cartwright, please go ahead. Thank you, hello. Uh, the challenge with having public comment at the beginning of the meeting is that when we call in, we might be addressing items that will be presented later. I hope that is the case tonight and that in this meeting, we will hear the plan to return middle and high school students to in-person learning in the very near future. I also hope there is a solid plan to vaccinate all teachers in Douglas County in the coming weeks. I have eighth and 10th grade sons and both tell me every day that they want to be in school full time and they hate remote learning, including the hybrid remote days. I understand the challenges for students at all grades and levels, and as parents, we are biased towards the situation for our own children. But I know I echo many parents of secondary students that more priority needs to be put on returning them to school in person. The grades in high school count. These students have worked hard for years to get to this point, and they have ambitious goals for attending college. Not only do they want a true high school experience with activities, sports, and dances, but our kids are high achievers who aspire to get into top tier colleges. Each week that they are forced to learn remotely hurts their learning and their grades. Last semester, grades were finalized and recorded, affecting our high, schoolers, high school students' GPAs permanently. They cannot afford to be out of school any longer and need to return in person absolutely as soon as possible. Not when it is the perfect scenario and logistically the smoothest transition time, but right away. We are running out of time, only one semester left to get their grades back on track. For our juniors and seniors, this last semester is even more critical. If I had to choose only one, I would ask for the priority to be put on returning our high school students. However, our middle school kids are also struggling. Our eighth graders are getting ready to register for high school without even really knowing, are they prepared to tackle those high school classes? Should they register for that honors bio class next year, even though they struggled in middle school science last semester? after being forced to learn this difficult subject remotely in front of a screen, our middle school students' grades matter too. I encourage you to make decisions tonight that will make parents in our district proud. Let us be the leader in bringing our secondary students back full time, not the follower, as the last caller just said. Not two steps behind Cherry Creek and other districts. We can do better than that. Our district's vision statement reads, Douglas County School District strives to maximize the potential of every student to pursue his or her chosen endeavor in society, including but not limited to post-secondary education, career, or military service. If so, then put more emphasis on our middle and high school students who are the closest to entering society. We don't have time to waste. Every day that other students in Colorado and in other states attend in-person in school while our students do not, it leaves our kids at a disadvantage. Please do everything possible to give our older students the opportunity to compete and achieve by getting them back to school in person full time as soon as possible. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Ms. Cartwright. I'm gonna pause for a minute to see if there are any other public commenters that we uh, missed. Um, 
that are on the phone right now. If you are a public commenter, uh, we have a phone number we can't identify. If you would unmute and just identify yourself, if you're a public commenter. All right, so I hear no other public commenters, so we'll close this part of our public comment session and would just again thank all the impassioned comments that we heard tonight and please know that your voices definitely are being heard. They definitely influence our thinking and we will continue to work very hard at finding solutions to get our kids back um, in person as soon as possible and as soon as safely possible. So thank you. Moving on to our next agenda, we have our consent agenda, which consists of five items. One being the, our annual resolution notifying how our meetings are posted, a settlement agreement um, with W.O. Danielson, DLH Architecture, and HCDA Engineering, approval of a construction agreement for roof replacement at Mountain Vista High School, approval of a change order for our career tech ed facility project that is happening at eight high schools, and approval of personnel changes. Is there a motion to accept our consent agenda? I move to accept the consent agenda. Second. Motion made by Holtzman, seconded by Graziano. Let's go ahead and vote. Director Chancha Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray. Aye. The consent agenda passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is to adopt the unofficial minutes. Is there a motion? Move to adopt the minutes. Second. Motion made by Graziano, seconded by Director Meek. Let's go ahead and vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. Passes unanimously. Next on our agenda then is back to interim Superintendent Wise. Uh, we have several items underneath the superintendent's report. The first one being any updates regarding our road to return. Mr. Wise. Absolutely. Um, you know, this presentation, uh, Superintendent Reports, is really combining a lot of uh, the topics that we heard within public comment. Also, um, trying to update to the most current information as we look at our tri-county data, as we look at what's happening uh, within our, our uh, state of Colorado and what's coming out. Uh, most recent, we've added some updates, so we try to call out what we've updated and go from there. You know, as we take a look at the return here this January, um, while we have some consistencies within our own school district and other schools and other districts, there's also variables. We did put a plan together and that plan has been fluid and we've been trying to communicate out clarity of where we are in next steps within that. And I'm gonna to continue to define that a little bit as we move forward. The emails, uh, the different presentations and sharing some of that, obviously it's gonna be repetitive, but at the same time updated with some, some new data. Um, you know, there are some schools that are starting back, and that would be at the hybrid level at secondary, and elementary full in person as soon as the 11th. There are some districts like ours that are looking elementary most impacted immediately and transitioning others. We're going to propose a little bit of where we currently are. When we look at our current data um, that you'll see here in a, a little bit, you know, that incident rate um, per 100,000, and we talked about that tipping point of 500 in October of where we felt that piece of uh, vulnerability, of not being able to have operationally the ability to stay open. Number of subs, schools, quarantining, as you've heard. Currently, as of today, we're at roughly 384. So when you look at that positivity or that, uh, um, uh, that rate within our community, we're at a good spot. We have time in which to measure our effectiveness of keeping elementaries open. We are working in the remote setting for both middle school and high school. But as we start looking at that and continue to have uh, the ability to keep schools open and also with our increased subs, the ability to come back earlier at a hybrid level, both middle school and high school. So we start looking at that within our last communication going out. Our dates looking at towards the end of January. We're really working now to get out to schools, the idea of a potential return January 25th. That would be both middle school and high school. While we are putting this out as a tentative date and we're planning and preparing for that, obviously we're gonna have to look at all the other things that are impacting us. 
We have additional subs, which I uh, continue to say thanks to our, our community uh, and volunteering for that side. As we start looking at, as we start looking at the other things that are impacting us, you know, what else can we do? We've hired three nurses. Unfortunately, we also had three nurses leave our schools. So we're even. So we need to continue to recruit uh, more nurses. So any of you out there that would like to apply, we have open postings and we need more nurses. We've continued to hire special ops. We've continued to hire EAs, educational assistants, and transportation educational assistants. Uh, we also would like to have uh, a number of people apply for those roles. So if you're out there and you'd like to, we need these to continue to not only um, stay open right now, but to increase our ability. So we start looking at pulling those resources, and I do feel that our current planning was, as we looked at the 19th board meeting, the return of middle school, roughly the 25th, really looking at that measurement of that incident rate uh, around 650. And then the idea of high school, if we hit that 600 mark, having that ability and sustaining those things. So these aren't set in stone, but it's our ability to operationalize and do what's best. Being roughly at 384, and if we can maintain that, a part of our tri-county meeting today, their prediction over the next two weeks is that we could be at 350. So it's trending in the right direction, which we'll see with our data. If that continues, and we have flooded our resource and have more and it's going well, that's reason why we're proposing to look at bringing back both middle school and high school at an earlier time. We're gonna have to do a lot of work. We need to involve our teachers. We need to ask what's needed. We need to prepare. We need to look at those roles. We do a great job with mitigation. We've heard that in the fall, and we do follow the protocols. We will keep pushing quarantine protocols, but we also have to uphold and follow those quarantine protocols that are in front of us. But that keeps us safe, but there's also challenges within that. But those challenges of reducing the 14 days to 10 is already in place. As we came back, we had quarantines starting off this week, and those quarantines over 10 days. Now, the ability that if kids and or adults are asymptomatic, and at day five, six, or seven, can test negatively, the opportunity to come back earlier at day seven, we are gonna be building that in. Now, the tricky part is depending on who is quarantined. If you have adults that are out that can't get back and you have kids coming back early, we have to create those opportunities where we're at least at 10 days, which is better, but does get complicated. And we'll be putting out more information for understanding of that and processes in each of our schools. That's true also as we were back middle school and high school. Um, we do have targeted quarantining. That did help us a lot. Hybrid is, it, it, it presents some strengths and it presents some challenges. We want kids in person. We will be working with our teachers and asking what's the best way to go. What are we willing to do? We have met and we will continue to meet, to meet with Tri-County about what are our options to be in person. We have moved up our vaccination process, communicating with our staff, putting those in place. We have our school nurses getting vaccinated this week. We've included our charter school nurses in that group. That's an important group in which to have uh, specialty piece and work with this quarantine process that are working with our kids that might and teachers that might have illness at school that we need to send home. But then we've also prioritized our other groups. Now, we are being impacted by the governor, the CDPAT requirements, changes within this. We're understanding tomorrow there's gonna be changes, uh, possibly of the vaccination protocols in those phases and availability. But I want you to know Centura and others have partnered with us. Health One with our school nurses, uh, Centura working with Kaiser within our groups in which to get our teachers um, and staff that are working with students vaccinated as quickly as possible. That's determined by availability of vaccines um, and then access of emailing out and scheduling those appointments and getting those done. So we have a great process set up. It's already started and will continue, but we're gonna be faced with some challenges that we don't always control. Now we're trying to control everything we can and set a strong plan, but we're gonna to have to be adaptive and responsive. We're gonna to have to be prepared of what's next and have multiple options in which to adjust. But I still believe that looking at these plans of, of coming back, um, we're in a better spot and we have the opportunity and ability in which to do that. And we'll continue to build readiness, continue to build uh, feedback and the needs in which to support that. We are addressing masks. We're addressing social distancing, we're reminding, and that's gonna be not only of students, but also of, of staff and teachers. 
So when we look at these, we want you to know that within our plan and what we continue to put in place uh, is happening. And a lot of, of stuff that we don't see behind the scenes. We want to try, try to make it more visible. So create understanding and work through this. And even in a presentation tonight, I hope there's a lot of people watching. I hope there's a lot of people that go back and watch. But how we can increase understanding and awareness is going to be very critical and important. And being factual within that. Um, you know, some of the other things that as we start to look at, as we look at uh, the ability to have COVID testing, uh, in our meeting today with the governor, the governor pulled together all the superintendents in Colorado with an invite. He and the governor's office has created an opportunity for testing free of charge for one full month. It's a take-home test. We opted in. We've already put in our, our process to get that. Uh, we're working to find out what that looks like and, me and means and how quick we'll get it. But the neat part and the exciting part is the opportunity that not only schools can have them to send home with kids, parents and families because they're in our system will request these, and you have an online practice which helps you go through the right way to do it and submit it to hopefully build accuracy, because that's going to be critical, and timeliness of getting the results back. So that's going to be a new process that we just heard about today, that we've already started to set up our protocols um, and our initiatives to get this going. In that same piece, the governor's offered uh, more PPE. While we have um, already ordered uh, supplies, We've also opted into that to be able to get more PPE uh, to expand our coverage and meet our needs for the rest of the semester. So we're appreciative of those efforts. Uh, these are new and brand new coming out to us today, but I also want you to know that um, there's gonna be challenges within that. As we get those tests, how well do they work? How quickly do they bring back? Can we use them to bring back people earlier from quarantine process? They're still working on that. They're still defining the answers, and we'll be partnering with them and pushing to help get the best results possible. Matt Reynolds is a part of the call, and as you know, Matt has become kind of a guru of our, our data points. And I referenced a little bit of this earlier. This is current as of today. So when you look up top uh, where we are in that incident rate uh, per 100,000, and Matt, if you can uh, come on, and I'm going to let you kind of take over the next couple slides and uh, partner with me. Perfect. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Happy New Year. Um, very glad to be back uh, to discuss our, our COVID data and our dashboard. Uh, we will be providing a, an update to our dashboard score on our website. Uh, the last one that we had posted was uh, pre-winter uh, break, but we will do it again this week to re-establish um, our normal cadence in, in regards to those reports. Uh, the data that you see here is uh, as of 1-3-21. Uh, uh, they did provide an update to this data as of today. So the numbers that uh, that are up there are slightly different than what they than what we have um, today. That top number 385 late this afternoon, they did update that. We're now at 402 or 40196 to be precise. Um, the other interesting data point that we uh, look at is C, which is the positivity. Um, instead of being at 6.33%, we're now at 6.96%. Uh, so we do seem to hover around this 400 level. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, if you look at our trend data, our trend data, um, as Corey had mentioned earlier, has been going in the right direction. Um, you know, since going back to around Thanksgiving, where, uh, you know, many of the districts across the, the metro region, the front region range, and including Douglas County, uh, made the decision to go uh, to full remote. That was just before our peak um, in terms of our values for cumulative incidence rate um, and also for a positivity rate. Uh, since that time, uh, with the additional restrictions that have been put in place and uh, really our, our community stepping up and doing what they need to do to make sure that they're socially distanced, um, our data has been trending in the right direction. Um, so if you look at that top one, uh, we're still sitting at, in this case, in this snapshot at 385, we're at 401 at this point, which puts us in the red or severe rate. Um, the one thing I do want to mention at the very top is you see this has our dial uh, level as red. Uh, this was pulled prior to our governor making the decision to change all of the, the counties uh, that were red into orange. So that would, uh, will impact on our ability to respond. Uh, it gives us uh, less restrictions, so it's, it's all trending in the right direction. Um, our percent two-week instance rates over time, it is negative, which is green. Again, it's trending in the right direction. 
Uh, we're approaching that threshold for the cumulative incidence rate of 350, uh, which is the predetermined uh, cut score that they, they had from earlier this year. Um, Tri-County may uh, make some changes to their metrics uh, just based on responding to the governor, but we'll work with them to uh, figure out what those changes may be. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a snapshot again um, of our uh, two-week average positivity, our hospitalization, and our two-week incidence rate for ages 5 through 18. Um, as you can see, um, our positivity is right now currently at 6.96. Uh, we're in that uh, yellow concern range. Um, our hospitalizations and incidence rates um, are in the negative percentages, which means we're still trending in the right direction uh, in regards to um, ages 5 through 18. Um, a few things of note, uh, with the governor making a decision to change all of um, our dial dashboard metrics to orange, um, that's in essence changing the goalposts uh, yet one more time. Uh, it feels like when we have these conversations, we, we talk about the data sets and, and having to change and, and be flexible. And this is another case where we'll have to continue to be flexible. Uh, but really the, the thing to, to take note is that our data is trending in the right direction. Next slide, please. Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, I think when you hear this, you know, we want logical, we want predictable. We have a strong plan that is evaluating, that's able to adapt. We're able to look at keeping it the same, moving it up, or postponing. I think when we look at our readiness for a number of indicators, we want to set some goals and some planning of work. What you're hearing from me is the idea that we work with our schools, our middle and high schools. We'll be evaluating our successful work with our elementaries. Transitioning in and out is tough. I understand working remote is tough, but there's consistencies in place right now at their middle school and high school level. Consistencies of engagement with their teachers daily. And as we start to move that forward, that is a strength of remote, but I also understand the weaknesses. Working with our schools of a target date in late January, looking at the data, building in the work with our principals and teachers to ask what do we need and how do we do this well in our return to hybrid right now. I do also want us to work on what does it look like to be back full in person. I don't want to make a guarantee, but what I do want to promise is we're going to engage in those conversations. We want to look at everything. We want to ask what is best for our students and what is best for our teachers and how we do that well. So we are actively working on all of this as we move forward. We'll continue to survey and ask and collaborate to work a plan. And we'll keep you updated not only at a board meeting, but through town halls each month. And also as we start to work forward with more communications going out. I'm sure parents are tired of my emails. Some of them are long. But I think trying to over communicate and set a clear plan is going to be important. You know, I also want to go back to when we hear um, what has COVID done and how has it impacted? You know, we talked about the, the grading piece and to transition a little bit, um, I, I want to try to get through some of these and, and would you like me to ask, have you ask questions on this piece or get through and then ask questions on all as we get through? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah I wonder in terms of wise yep. if we can yep. stop, pause here yep. um, and ask our questions regarding your recommendations based on the data to return middle and high school back earlier. Um, board directors, are there questions about the data or that recommendation um, thus far? Let's just pause there for a moment. And I do wanna ask, I don't know if Mr. Reynolds is still on, do we, do we see a pretty much a tight correlation between the positivity rate and the incidence rates? And, and, and what I'm wondering about, I know we put a lot of, a lot of emphasis on those incidence rates. Um, and I know that Mr. Reynolds said that our positivity, positivity rate was actually decreased since this particular slide. And I'm curious about the positivity rate, if that's a predictor of the incident rates, if we see any kind of correlation. Um, because I guess my non-logical mind would say that as we continue to see that positivity rate going up, um, that also would give us some pause in terms of whether that incident rates go up. But so my question really to Mr. Yeah. Reynolds is, do we, have we watched that data? I know we did a two week average 
Have we, do, have we watched that positivity rate for spikes and valleys? And is there a correlation to the incident rates? Yeah, Matt's still available. Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, President Ray, for the question. Um, there seems to be, and, and granted, this is really only one season of data, there seems to be a relationship between uh, the, the higher positivity rate and incidence rate both being high. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that do go into that regarding, you know, how many people get tested and that sort of thing. Uh, but just as we've gone through, we've seen that, you know, when we had the peak on the previous slide regarding incidence rate, we also saw our positivity rate, uh, you know, double what it's sitting now at, at uh, you know, a double digit uh, positivity rate. So there seems to be a relationship. Um, I'd have to work with uh, Tri-County Health to expand just beyond our data uh, to look at our data in conjunction with uh, their full data set to ask that question about a full correlation. Uh, but there seems to be a relationship there. And so really our 10% seems to be the alarm when we set the alarm to say that positivity rate is going the wrong direction. If we hit the 10%, if, as long as we stay down in the single digits, we feel comfortable. But if we hit the 10% or greater, is that kind of what, from your experience, Mr. Wise and Mr. Reynolds, that um, is a good indicator of, of us being in a good zone is below 10% positivity? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so on the next slide, you can see the cut scores that have been established by Tri-County Health. Yes, yes. They've identified a 10% as one of their cuts to go from a, a good range of you know below 5% to being medium between five and 10 and to be high between 10 and 15. They themselves have identified 10% uh, as being one of their cuts to establishing a different uh, level of concern or different color value here. So yes, 10% seems to be a, a, a marker that they've chosen. Um, and our data, just watching the data over time seems to support that decision. Okay, very good. I'm gonna ask directors in the dais first for questions and then if we can uh, not share so I can see the other directors that are remote. So directors in the dais right now, any, any further questions regarding the first part of this presentation? Director Holtzman, go ahead. Sure, um, so I, I think these are probably just more clarifying questions, but I know that as we talked on December 10th, um, it was obvious that Obviously, we all have a desire for all of our students to be in person. We know that's the best way they learn. We also recognize that our students and our staff um, have done a great job mitigating the risk by using all those factors. And so I want to say thank you for that. Um, but as we look at moving forward, I just, my question really is, um, on that December 10th meeting, it was, you know, obviously continuing to mitigate risk as much as possible, but it also had a lot to do with our operational sustainability, which we've talked about a lot. Um, is that still one of our primary goals in order that students have stability um, wherever they're at with our elementary students being in person full time right now, um, avoiding transition for them and for our most impacted students that are back in a more full time way right now. Um, as well as when middle and high school hopefully do come back to more in person, is that still our priority to um, avoid, you know, transition after transition after transition? Is it still important to us um, stability for our students in order to most effectively provide educational opportunities? Yes. Um, you know, there's a lot of variables. And wanting to have stability and build that forward and sustain that is a clear variable that, that we've identified is important. Um, going back to the positivity rate and along with incident rates, as we look at those indicators that are going up, it's not just the health safety, it's also that opportunity to sustain and have some consistency in place. You know, we are hoping that the changes in quarantine and process helps decrease the amount of transitions and the length of transitions but we're also in a different time. Back December 10th, I believe our incident rate was up around 800. So we are now at a point where we're managing at upper level and it's coming down, whereas in the fall we were managing as it was starting to go up and plateau and come down. You know, our goal is to continue to monitor. We're in a new time. Um, we have different strains that could increase, you know, the spread. But we also have the vaccine and we have mitigating factors that we hope to contain and keep our numbers low. Consistency is key. As a 
group of schools and a community, if we can keep our numbers at that lower range, we've increased resources within our district to operationalize. And if we can focus on teaching and learning to try to be as stable as possible and consistent, it's gonna be key. There's probably not a perfect date or time. No matter what we choose, it's gonna be a bit of a roller coaster this spring, as we've seen throughout the fall. But I think how we put our plans together, continue to evaluate these now that we're gaining more knowledge, no one's an expert yet. Mm -hmm. And if, in my opinion, if we claim we are, uh, we're wrong. We're, we're learning as we go. But I think we are looking better at what we're doing, better at the data to make decisions, and hopefully uh, continue to have that stable environment, whether it be in person, hybrid, or also uh, using the remote system. And our schools, I'm gonna say this, as we get into the next topics, our schools are working hard to be better at remote. We're gonna work harder to help our students be better, our families be better, our teachers be better. And you know, that's, that's part of where we are as a secondary group this spring. Um, we look at our schedules that have tweaked and try to improve engagement and time. Uh, we look at our instructional factors, our intervention factors that, that will be better regardless. But yes, we want to build consistency. I, I, I do worry, um, no matter how much we want that, there's gonna be, we're gonna have to roll schools out, roll classes out. Uh, we're gonna learn from this piece, but we wanna build in the time where we can sustain that consistency. That's key. Thank you. I may have one or two other questions, but I'll let other directors go first. Okay, other directors on the dais, first of all. Um, looking at our Zoom, our directors that are Zoom, any questions in Zoom land? Uh, go ahead, Director Lung. Well, thank you very much for all the data and for all the work um, on the behalf of the school district to reopen our school. Um, I think it's always our goal, the board and the superintendents, to put everybody back um, for in-person learning, five days in-person learning, um, the ideal situations. And I think it's very consistent, the board in the December meeting to make that, try to make that happen. Um, that's why we have five days um, primary school learning right now. And then I really appreciate the interim superintendents' leaderships to uh, get the middle school and the high school back to hybrid in January, which is um, not the plan originally. So um, there's a couple of questions I have. One, uh, is there a particular data spawn from um, the state to dictate in which that point the school can um, do five days in person learning or hybrid or um, e-learning, I mean, what, 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 from the state's point of view, um, or from the health department's point of view, which data point is the most important? And, I'm gonna let and, Matt. Um, my second question is, I just wanted to have some clarifications on um, the risk to our student uh, populations from K-12. If I understand the number correctly, there's actually, oh, 4,099, uh, 4,991 case uh, dead in Colorado. There's only one case, there's actually one case um, that is from a zero to nine populations. And around six case that is, uh, belongs to a ring age group of 10 to 19. And over 347,000 um, COVID positive case, there's actually uh, 1,346 that is in age group of zero to nine, and there's almost close to 37,000 that is in the teenager range. So I, I just want to make sure that um, I get the fact because I sometimes I hear people just feeling that there's no risk to our kid. Yeah, so I'm going to defer to Matt a little bit, but let me answer some of this, and Matt can get the, the technical piece. You know, you look at the data from the state, CDPHE or even the governor, and it's obvious moving everyone to orange. There's a, a push to have us back in person, hybrid and or full. So when you look at that side, as we talked about our planning within elementaries, part of this work is this is starting to happen. We need to monitor and make sure we do it well. But when we, stuff comes, when, when we see it coming at us, we need to control what we can control. And I think uh, when we talk about how do we get input, 
I think we need to ask, what do we need to do to make this happen? What are your needs? How can we be successful? We see it coming. So what's our planning and work to be ready? There's not going to be a perfect way. But I'm also going to say to put out questions of, do you want to, is not a fair ask either. Because when we see the need and we see the, the, the data points that are changing, Director Long, um, and having an orange side along with where our current health data is, even in our, in our county, we're planning the right way. We want to do what's right. There's pressure all around. There's different viewpoints all around. Not everyone's going to be happy with any of the answers, but I think we need to do what's right. And I think this plan moving forward of what data points and our timing of our work is right. And I also think we can do it well. Okay, so I'm going to let Matt talk a little bit about those changes and what that means and some of the data points that we hear. And uh, then Director Tancho Shore, I don't know if, if you want to jump in before or let Matt uh, no, let's go, ahead. go we'll to go that. Ahead. Director, Director Reynolds, or Mr. Reynolds first, then we'll do Director Tancho Shore. Mr. Reynolds, go ahead and finish. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, to answer your, your question in short order, uh, really there is not one single data point uh, that's the driving force to any of these decisions. You know, Tri-County Health put out multiple metrics that are caution metrics for schools for us to monitor uh, in addition to what uh, CDPHE puts out. So there's not one single metric. And you know, when you think about the metrics, with the governor making the decision to change all of our status from red to orange, he made that uh, decision and the metrics stayed the same. Uh, the, the numbers themselves did not change. He made the decision to change those colors. So, you know, that happened as recently as last week. And so um, I think that was a surprise to our own local health department that, that decision was made. So we have to be able to respond to that in terms of, uh, you know, meeting with Tri-County Health and looking at what does that mean for us in terms of how we respond to all of our cases. And that's the work that we're going to continue to do. All right. Director Tantra Shore, go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah, I just, um, I just feel obligated to um, point out that, you know, school districts respond to all of the things that we are required to respond to. And when governors make changes, school districts are required to respond. When Tri-County Health makes changes, school districts are required to respond. And that means that school districts have to make these ulterior plans and these options available. And, and I guess what I want to emphasize at this point, and I think our school district is so good at really wanting to hear our parent population and, and listen and listen to our teachers. And, and I just want to point out that schools and school districts are listening and doing what can be done, but the target continues to be moved. And then Matt Reynolds and company have to look at data that was literally color changed um, by our governor and then everything changes. So it's not reasonable for our, our populate our, our community to expect everything to be so black and white when we are not given black and white circumstances to change with. So what I wanna point out is what I think I'm hearing is a, a several options that we are trying to put in place as a school district. And that also we are very clearly saying that we're not necessarily in control of some of the things that are happening and some of the things that we are required to respond to. Um, so I just want to make that point clear. I, I, everybody tries to kind of go around that and, and pretend like it's really just the school district and the school board and the school, the school admin making decisions when what we are doing is responding to decisions that are being made for us. All right, thank you, Dr. John Shore. I'm gonna circle back to Director Holtzman. Did you have other questions? I just have one more. All right, please, go ahead. Yeah, um, first I wanted to thank you, Interim Superintendent Wise, for helping to lead um, with the other superintendents. I know that I think it was about a week or two ago that you all held a press conference and you spoke, and I know that you had many meetings other than that to speak with the governor and CDPHE and encourage them to move our school staff um, up the ladder to get more immediate vaccination. So thank you for speaking to that. Thank you for encouraging that. And 
I am happy that that's happening. Um, and I understand that we only have so much control. Um, you know, we, we don't know how much vaccine is gonna get to a hospital or to our county. And, but we know that you're in those conversations and we appreciate that. So um, my final question really is one that I hear from the community quite a bit right now. Um, and really just a clarification, but I know that as we move forward, um, like Director Chancho Shore said, you've, you're really throwing out goals and options, and I appreciate that you're gonna be talking to our school leaders and um, monitoring this data over the next couple of weeks. I'm just curious if you or Mr. Reynolds or someone else could speak to um, what Tri-County may have shared with you about um, looking forward at a possible post-December holiday surge. You know, we know that some of our families may have been with others and have just been returning over this past last weekend, what that might look like and if you'll be monitoring it. And also, um, I think it might have been Director Lung that mentioned variants. That's kind of a hot topic right now. We know that that's near us. You know, is there any information that Tri-County has shared as to what we can expect or what we should be looking at? and just an assurance that we'll continue to do that. So Matt, Mr. Reynolds, I'm gonna have you start. We're both part of a, a meeting with Tri-County today. I'll let him go and then I'm gonna give a bit of a synopsis of direction and kind of pull it together uh, as an ending point, okay? Thank you, Director, for the question. Um, in terms of the post uh, Christmas surge, you know, that, that's been widely discussed uh, across the entire nation and you know, we're looking at our current data and Tri-County uh, Health did discuss this today that our, our data right now is trending in the right direction, but that's not to say that we shouldn't continue to monitor it in case we do see this increase um, as a rebound effect of what could happen as a result of the holiday season. So we're gonna continue to monitor that with Tri-County Health and, and let them lead the way in, in telling us how to interpret the data um, and really what to expect. Um, there is, uh, you know, somewhat of, of a guess in terms of how we're gonna respond. Um, I mean, we're, our response in our community looks far different than what's happening in California or Arizona and some of these other communities. And so we're gonna to continue to monitor the data uh, that we have locally uh, to see what's gonna happen with uh, the, the spike or, or perceived spike from uh, the winter break. And to go along with that, I think it reflects a little bit what Director Chancho Shore had said. You know, December 10th was prior to the task force report was prior to the governor's press conference. We created a solid plan, a plan that had projected dates, that had fluidity, that had evaluation of a number of indicators to be able to adjust that plan appropriately. Current state, we're looking at the strong possibility of adjusting it earlier. That can change. But I think when you have a strong plan, it allows you to adapt and respond. It allows us to be proactive, have multiple options. If we wait to prepare, we're gonna be reacting. So we're gonna start preparing now. And then when we get to the 19th and closer to the 25th, we'll have a better idea of where we currently are. That impacts decision-making, implementation. But preparation and planning, um, we need to get ahead of. I feel like we've done a much better job of that. Uh, thanks to a great staff that's putting it together. You look at Matt Reynolds' work, along with everyone else behind the scenes in schools, um, our elementaries are back in person today, full in person. Uh, I heard excitement uh, from schools in EDAS about uh, having kids in person and, and we know that. So I think those same plans will adjust and will help us be more successful. It's not gonna be perfect the rest of the semester. Uh, Director Meek, I think you had a, a piece, I, or David? I get to call on her. Yep. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Director Meek, sorry. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, I just really wanted to point out and acknowledge the level of collaboration that's really happened this school year. You know, I'm just, we're stronger together and to see how hard we're working with public health and public health has changed guidelines, but they're learning. We're going through a pandemic that we've never gone through before. The governor changes things as well. I think everyone is trying to do their best to navigate a situation and I just wanna remind everyone, we're stronger together. And the more that we do listen to our employees, the more we work with public health, the more we work with the governor, you know, we're gonna come out of this stronger. And so I am just, I just think it's worth taking a moment and acknowledging how much stronger we are 
because of the lessons that we've learned around taking time to collaborate with each other and figure this out together. And I think the more we can not blame other people for changing decisions or changing the goalposts. I mean, it's, it's hard, it's frustrating, it's very confusing to the public. And I think everyone's doing their best to figure out how to get through this. Thank you, Director Meek. I do wanna just uh, capture one clarity uh, in terms of Superintendent Wise that I wanna emphasize for our community is the whole adjustment of protocol quarantine or the quarantine protocols. Um, and really emphasizing the fact that we have to have parents that are willing to get their kids tested. Um, you know, and you talked about the possibility of the take-home test as a, a, an additional incentive, but I, I'm hoping that the letters that we send out when we quarantine kids really emphasize that if your child is tested on day five, they can come back to school earlier than the 14 day that we've had in the past. And I, and I think that's an important piece of our puzzle to get our community to help us so that we are making sure we're not sending kids back from quarantine that are ill, or we're, we're not sending kids out to quarantine for 14 days who are healthy uh, for a very long period of time. So I just, I'm hoping that our communication is on top of that um, in terms of really emphasizing that's a new incentive for our parents that we really wanna see taken advantage of. Yeah, and the new, the new quarantining process, even Tri-County, is still sorting through. Um, seating charts at elementary looks very different than seating charts at middle school or high school levels. So they're listening to us about what that really means. And then we're also working the protocols in a quarantine process. How do we personalize to each situation? Because it's gonna be dependent on who all is quarantined, the asymptomatic process, the timeline, and then getting those tests. And I agree with you. One of the big pushes to have this testing for all districts, and I give kudos that we are gonna have testing for, for all districts, um, is the ability to look at that quarantine in effect. We haven't been able to test very many people that are quarantined. So I think this will help us in that process, not only to return, but to gain important data. Um, it's gonna give us more thresholds and information to help us in our decision making, to help us see impact and changes as we go out through this spring. You know, we're, we're hopeful with the vaccinations. I'm still worried that that's gonna change because it's been quick to move educators into it and it's gonna have an ebb and flow, I worry, in the days to come that we do not control. Right. Right. But we've partnered with agencies to offer multiple ways in which to get vaccinated in multiple locations, and those are starting up now. And in the weeks to come, we hope that continues. And a bit's gonna be a variable of, of the number of new vaccines coming to us and the amount. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a piece that's, that we're gonna have to be prepared for. And it's, again, we hope that it's quick, we hope that it's all, but we're gonna be prepared for multiple scenarios and adjust and, and serve. Very good. And, I, and just again, just to emphasize Director Holtzman's point about sustainability, because that was really what this plan has been from the get-go is, you know, is making sure that this is sustainable so we don't have the ins and the outs. And I think that's an important for our community to understand too, is it's just not trying to get kids back in school and, and then all of a sudden quarantining or having to shut down high schools like we did in the past. It's being able to guarantee that once we get them back in school, we're not sending them like a revolving door in and out of the schools. So, um, so anyway, any, any other questions, directors, about the first part? So, um, Mr. Or, sorry, Director Hanson, go ahead. I just wanted to clarify, Director Ray, your previous comment. I agree that the sustainability of um, maintaining the kids in a classroom environment is the most important, but. Um, I'm afraid that was slightly misleading given that we don't actually have control over quarantine requirements. We can do our very best to mitigate and to reduce the amount of time students are on quarantine and to reduce the impact of that. But as I understand it, um, we truly don't have any control of that. And once we have kids in school, the quarantine and the back and forth is somewhat inevitable. Yeah, and I just wanna clarify, my comment about the sustainability is the overall plan for sustainability, not, not necessarily the quarantine protocol, but I think that's what our staff has said from the get-go, as opposed to just bringing everybody back full-time, 100%, we're going to start with elementary, 
look for, can that be sustained? Do we have the resources to be able to sustain that? And then we move on to the next level. So I was really speaking from it from a more global uh, philosophy that you have put in place in terms, Superintendent, in terms of how we roll this plan out so that we're cautious, we observe, and then we move on to the next level. But I agree, Director Hansen, there are many variables that are out of our control as well. And, and am I correct that it is inevitable that we will have students in and out of quarantine once, I mean, officially starting today with elementary students back in school, we are back in the business of tracing and there will be quarantine notices and there will be kids who are not able to attend school due to measures that are outside of our control, correct? Correct. We correct. have less control of temporary classes moving into quarantine or teams or even schools, but that's a temporary process. We want to minimize that because those transitions are tough also. When you have large number of schools, whole levels of schools or an entire district, that also is even a larger disruption interruption. So as we start to do this to sustain, it's the ability that we don't lose people. Um, as I said to you, we lost three nurses. Thank goodness we had the opportunity to hire three, but we're breaking even. We wanted to increase our capacity to be able to sustain and do this work, not hit that tipping point. So as we start to have our data and variables go, we also have to make sure we can maintain. But yes, we will have classes that have to rotate out. We're gonna have schools that have to rotate out at times, but hopefully we have stronger mitigation, we have stronger sub coverage, and we have less of that because we do have a lot more subs in the mix. Thank goodness, thank you. Uh, so I do think we might have less, but again, those are variables that we're gonna have to wait and see with, with impact, um, how much less. But yes, that's part of the reason why we wanted to wait. That post-holiday surge, we have three weeks of data in which to now continue to evaluate to say what's that surge gonna look like? Will it plateau and drop back down again? Um, we aren't sure, well, there's predictions out there. We need to wait and see, but we also know how to adjust and we hope to, to decrease those transitions. But there will be, yeah, I mean, we're gonna have, we're gonna have transitions with COVID. In quarantine, you. yes. Director Just Holston, one last follow-up question for clarification. I, I heard several times through public comment that um, neighboring districts or um, other schools in Douglas County, private schools or charter schools are able to maintain full-time in-person learning. I just wanted to clarify that, um, if you can answer, every school in Douglas County is subject to identical quarantine protocols as each and every one of our individual buildings, correct? Yes, that's correct. And so there's no way to opt out. There's no waiver that's available. We are all playing by the same rules. That's correct. I will say when you look at size of our district and the number of schools and resources for all those schools, it's a very different parameter than one school or a few schools. We talked about that in the last meeting, part of this plan of sustainability. Um, as we get back, we will be working with individual schools and that ability for a school to stay open, a, a class or a team. That's very different to operate on one school or a few schools in decision making versus the capacity of our very large school district. We are the third largest school district in Colorado. So that ability to work within a school, let alone an entire district with our, all of our resources and sustain is part of the decision why we put this plan in place. And I'm also gonna say predicting out to where we are, it's a pretty solid plan that's allowing us to be fluid that's allowing us to look at adapting this plan to meet the needs of the current state. All right, Director Holtzman and then Director Meek. Yeah, I, I think, I just wanted to make sure that when I was speaking, I was speaking about operational sustainability. Um, and I think we all agree that quarantines and, and doing what our local public health department and CDPHE um, require of us is important. That's one of the reasons we've mitigated risk so well. So I certainly wasn't indicating that I didn't want to do that. It's it's more of um, that operations operational st stability so that if we are able to send our middle and high school students back for hybrid, which I certainly think we're on track to do, um, that we don't suddenly two weeks later have to move them back to remote. And then versus, you know, it's, it's that operational model that I was speaking to, that we'd like to have 
um, students be able to know that this is what I'm doing for the rest of the year. Um, we, we can't guarantee it, but I just wanted to make sure that was still a priority and a goal. Very good. You said that much better than I did. Thank you. Um, Directors, so I think we're going to pause here uh, in terms of well, since it's 8.05 and take a break. But uh, before we do that, I think it's worth just pausing to say, do we still feel, do, as a board, are we at consensus that we still support the recommendation that uh, interim superintendent Wise is moving forward with a lot of work in consultation with staff and various agencies? Um, but if I've, if I've got it right, um, we're moving forward with st the return for our elementary students continues and then the possibility of targeting January 25th for bringing both high school and middle schools back to a hybrid model at that time, observing that for, for a period of time and then eventually evaluating five days a week for those levels of students. Is there any... Um, are we at consensus? Are we in agreement that that's a good plan? And Director Lung, I see your hand. Well, th this is an info only item, so um, I, it's, uh, it's not appropriate for me to make motions. B but I personally would like to um, see whether it is, um, what parameter is possible for us to go back, to go to our five days in-person learning um, after the president's day. Um, I would love to, uh, to hear um, what need to be done so that we could, we could do that. I mean, I fully support um, continuous uh, with a path for five days you know, in elementary school and have hybrid um, for, middle and, for middle and high school on uh, January 25th. But I also would like to see what can we do so that we can have five days in person learning after after President's Day? And Director Lung, let me ask you: um, is, since interim Superintendent Wise's plan is for us for him to update us at our next board meeting after the hybrid implementation of high school and middle school, do you think you can wait until that time before you make that recommendation? Because I hear him saying, let's, again, see if it's sustainable. And then if we can start targeting five days a week in person learning, then we'll talk about that at our next board meeting. Is there a, is there a reason you were feeling a sense of urgency to have that decision made tonight? Well, I, uh, well, you know, <laughs> Presence they come really fast, and uh, five days in person learning is. Um, I, I think um, a lot of people, you know, have that in mind for high school and, uh, and middle school student. I think the earlier we plan for that, you know, the better. Um, I um, have no issues if we can wait until uh, the January 19 board meeting for me to make a motion or for me to uh, to ask for that to be implemented. Um, I mean, the board, of course, the upper member can vote it up or down. Um, at that time, but I just I just uh, want to raise that right now and uh, state that I would like to see what needs to be done for that to happen. And good. I would not um, I I do not have object to uh, you know full consent to uh, voice my support of uh, the current proposal um, on the table. Very good, thank you, Director Long. So at this point, unless I hear objections, I hear that we are in consent for supporting interim superintendent's plan as we move forward with high school and middle school. Um, and at this time, board, let's take about a 10 minute break and reconvene at 820.
Okay, board directors, we're going to go ahead and reconvene our meeting, and um, we will go back to Mr. Wise to go ahead. Oh, Director Todd Shore, you said you made wanted to make a statement. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Director A. That was just a little bit earlier, but that's okay. Um, I, I've just wanted to really appreciate, um, I really, really appreciate the efforts in providing options and providing us with details and steps to take and here's some opportunities and here's some things we're thinking about. Um, I just really want to take a minute to appreciate the work um, that goes into planning for something this um, this moving of a target like. Um, it's it takes effort, it takes thought, it takes communication. Um, and I want to appreciate the work of the Douglas County School District staff and the parents and the community and the kids that are standing behind and being as flexible as possible and understanding the process in, in creating an environment that's safe and that um, we can provide an education for our kids to the best of our ability. I wanna make a statement that says, I, I believe that our school district is working to provide the best education possible and we have a long way to go. Um, and, our staff is working to attain uh, an air, something that's never been attained before. So, um, you know, in appreciation for that, I, I just don't think there's enough said for the kind of work that is being done. So I just want to take a moment to appreciate. Okay, thank you, Director Chan Shore. And we'll move on, Mr. Weiss, to the next topic on your presentation. And I appreciate that. And, and we have a lot to do. Starting tomorrow, working with schools and principals. Coming back from break, having a board meeting Tuesday right after break. Yes. There's a lot of new information coming out to the system. Probably not always the best way to start that information, but a lot of work to do. And uh, we have great people, uh, principals, teachers, going to be working together with our, with our uh, EDOS and leadership to continue that work. You know, the, the same is true when you look at the overview of, of first semester. You know, when we start talking about and what we've heard, the, the strengths and the weaknesses, the challenges during this first semester. It was tough. You know, we've talked about it. It was tough on kids. It was tough on parents. It was tough on teachers. But we are going to be better because of it. As we neared the Thanksgiving break and winter break, we did have the high school principals come forward with a plan to try to support their students and the impact of COVID. We did put in place a grade scale change. It's not perfect. Each school is a little bit different, but when you look at our district average of where we were last fall and where we ended this fall with that change, and this is failure rate. All of our schools with the furlough day had to work with grades and some of them were just continuing to get their grades in as we got back. So their high school principals and teachers are working with their grading components. Where did they fall? What can we do differently and better? But as you start taking a look at this, last year at semester, we had about 11% failure rate. That's an F in one or more classes. This year with that change, we ended up about 15. So with that impact, it kept us similar, but still was a difficult year. But when we look at that, I don't want to accentuate that it was worse. It was a tough year for everyone. Kids will be better prepared, parents are gonna be better prepared, and our teachers and schools are gonna be better prepared. We've already started to look at those adjustments. Um, when we look at schedules and engagement during this remote time, the schedules for kids to be with their teachers and engaged has increased the number of days. There's worry of amount of time on a computer, but each of the schools are not having kids sit on a computer all day. But we also want them with their teachers and classmates more often. That engagement and purposeful piece, identifying students as soon as they struggle, and working with meetings such as care and concern meetings, interventions, um, trying to help earlier, getting parents involved uh, is going to improve on all accounts. So I just want to accentuate that, just like with all the feedback, some of it's hard to hear, but we do listen. It's not always going to make each decision happen, but it influences, it tries to help us, and we are going to be better because of it, and I mean that true with everyone. So when we start looking at these things of where are we and where are we going, you know, as we said, we're going to be working with teachers in our data. 
they're looking at all of their grades in the high school level. We heard earlier, grades do matter. They matter at every level, but the high school level, they're transcripted. So how can we go back and work with those gaps, work with those grades, and help students and teachers be more successful? I think all of us could look back and say, what could we do differently? So these are just reminders of what we uh, have in place, what schools are working on, what they're going to continue to work on with their teachers uh, throughout this uh, remote time, regardless of length of time. You hear our reiteration of our plan and see where we get to. But I also want you to know that semester, we've got a new strain. We don't know what that new strain is going to do with, uh, with our numbers and impact. So we're going to have to be ready to adjust. Let's hope that with vaccination and other mitigating factors, it doesn't have a big impact. But we don't know. Tri-County and CDPHE CDP don't know. But we're going to be ready. And we're putting things in place. And we're going to continue to learn and grow because there's, it's not going to be perfect as we go. As we look at some of those mitigating factors, we had questions come out of town halls and, and at comment about masks. We're giving those reminders of appropriate masks. Um, as middle school and high school kids come back, staff and teachers, how do we work with all of us to have best practice? We're gonna encourage and make available the uh, KN95 masks and the surgical masks. We have increased PPE offered from uh, the state, which we're gonna opt into. So that's gonna be available, we wanna encourage it. To mandate it of kids and or teachers is tough because how you do that well and also uh, provide the mitigating factors, but also provide the level of, of ability full day when you're in school in person is also a piece we have to, to balance on that side. But we're going to remind to wear appropriate masks. Um, the vented ones, excuse me, the vented ones, uh, any of the others that, that are not appropriate, we'll remind kids. We continue to remind kids and adults to keep your masks on and to have good habits. That's what helped us. We need to give reminders. There is fatigue. We're all people but we're gonna to continue to give those reminders to be successful. So as we take a look at, at the impact, um, the reality, but also what we're gonna to do uh, to be better and be proactive, uh, to continue to remind and give communication, uh, hopefully that gives you a brief, but also idea of the work ahead. And we'll continue in our student achievement monitoring reports to not only give data of a collective system, but also the more that target of what's happening currently. So, well, in the upcoming meetings, it's kind of a preview of where we're really going to break that down. And you'll even hear later tonight with uh, some of the, the goals and focus and priorities of what that actionably is and can look like. Questions? Thanks, uh, Mr. Weiss. Um, back on the slide where we looked at the percentages of student performance. so. The 2020 data then incorporates the change in the grading scale, is mm -hmm. that right? So yes. had, had that grading scale not changed and we were really comparing same standard, that percentage would have been higher. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. That's correct. And then we, we also heard um, from one of our commenters that was a teacher of just being surprised. What is the process when we, when we do make a decision like that that really impacts our teachers, that really does impact how they assess students? How do we come to that conclusion to make that decision? How, does, how is teacher voice heard? Yeah, so let's look on reflection. Um, how can I myself be better? When we heard from high school principals at quarter and those progress reports of grades being low and asking to start to work with teachers, start to work with kids, do surveys, what I heard is there are a number of factors of what helped and what impacted that. Um, schools were pushed out on quarantines, the ability to get with PLCs and staff. Um, all of our principals are going to be much more intentional with all of their teachers. The timing of principals bringing this forward, going into Thanksgiving and making that change and representing a greater impact, I think including teachers, messaging teachers before and after, we can all get better at. So um, me to ensure that's happening at every level with all of our leadership, I own that, and I need to partner with our high school principals and, and every level of principals to say, what are we doing with our teachers? How are we doing that? How are we making sure we're having these conversations? Now, I'm going to tell you, the result might have been the same, because each school and even each teacher might have been a little bit different. We had different schools who worked with grades and kids and teachers um, differently. We're a big system, and when you have nine schools of 2,000 kids roughly each, some greater, some a little less, that's a lot of people to have consistency, but we're gonna be, be much more proactive, we're gonna be much more inclusive, 
Uh, I've talked with teachers in the system to say, we're not planning to do that this semester. We need to be better in advance, focus on teaching and learning, identify kids and in interventions, and pull in supports, and work up front so we aren't doing this towards the end. I guess I kind of had the same question, and so I'll elaborate on that a little bit. I'm just really worried about teacher burnout and trying to think what can we do to ensure that we are making teachers feel heard and respected and, and included in decision making. So I would love, um, I'm just bringing up I would love to have a future conversation around how we can ensure that we are getting systemic feedback from our teachers. So they feel heard, they feel respected, they feel like they're part of the decision-making progress process. And, you know, I just think the teacher shortage has been a problem. It's gonna continue to be a problem and everything we can do to focus on how we can make our employees feel valued in that regard is gonna be really important moving forward. Yeah. And I've asked our school leadership to work with principals and teachers, uh, find ways to have consistent and regular feedback, different topics. Um, so I would, I would say that's part of our plan and work moving forward to increase and improve that um, and hopefully demonstrate that and, and, and show you that and everyone that. Very good. Correctors, other questions, Dr. Graziano? And then Director Long, I see yours yeah. as well. Um, I don't have a, a question so much as just a comment or a conversation I'd like to kind of raise or just get some thought around this. Um, there's been discussions or, or uh, studies done recently, and, then, and this jumps to mind because the drop that I just saw for the high school scores, right? I, I don't know if that kind of blends itself across some of the other numbers for other students, but... There's been um, studies or actually reports now that have been released around some a tutor a national tutoring um, program, kind of like a, a tutoring corps, AmeriCorps kind of thing. And I know here in the district, you know, we've had a lot of things that we've had to put, we haven't been able to deliver on, like a lot of career and tech ed things and internships and whatnot. So my qu my comment is, given we've had some, the, we clearly going to have reductions in how well our our students are doing, and we're not, you know that that doesn't mean that they're not be learning other things or getting you know, just doing the best they can and, and coping with this. But I, I'd like to see if there's maybe something that we can do where we can explore the idea of a a Douglas County type program that's a tutoring program to help catch kids up, um, you know, and something that we can put in place where the things I've read where it. It's you know middle schools tutoring elementary schools high schools tutoring middle schools and you know college kids kids who've went to Douglas County schools who've gone out to college are then coming back and tutoring high school students and so I think we have a you know again an opportunity here to do something again that we never would have planned for in our you know and, and I, I never would have thought of doing something having this conversation here on the board but to doing something that's hard but really will um, serve to help, I'm not, I don't want to say catch up, just help our kids prosper. And so I, I don't know if this is a, a task force, if this is something that is a spinoff, but I really think it's something that we should consider because as we work our way through this year, I think people, you know, I think there's an opportunity again to get to do this with our students um, and have it be an opportunity for them to work with one another, help build community, um, and help, you know, just, you know, learn, you know, learn more. How's that sound? Um, so I, I would ask that you you go back and think about that with your your cabinet, um, and may and and see how we can maybe formulate something like that here locally, um, here in Douglas County, um, to to do this for our students. Noted. Thank you. Dr. Yep. Dr. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, so minimally looking at what, what do we do to support the students that have fallen behind? Or how, do, how do we enhance, enhance their learning? Um, yeah, and I don't think it's just necessarily anyone who's fallen behind. I think it's just um, anyone, uh, everyone has different goals and things that they, you know, mm -hmm. obviously 
we, we certainly want to help, help catch up anyone who thinks they, who needs that, but I think it, anyone could potentially benefit. And I think sure. any student could put their, you know, be part of that to, to, to tutor. So I'd, you know, yeah. again, I think this is, there's, there's ways we can discuss this and put this together. So I don't know, there's no, it's what, whatever we want it to be, I guess. Very good, all right. Thank you, Director Graziano. Director Lung? Um, I, I echo Dr. Graziano's um, concern uh, about, you know, our student. Uh, after all, that's why we sit here is for the 60,000 student. So um, the questions that I have is maybe could uh, Lancy probably answer that. Um, so the mental health issues is um, consistently being um, uh, raised by the parents and teen suicide. Um, I know that our school district has been doing a wonderful job of providing additional support, but I would like to see some hard data. Did um, our county has a huge increase in teenager suicide rate in 2020 compared to 2019 and 2018? How about teenager hospitalizations um, due to mental health issues? Um, because I mean, even though one teenager died because of suicide is a horrible thing, um, um, so any number would be bad, but I just want to see year to year comparison. Um, do we have a pandemic um, because of the COVID-19? Um, I know that our school district has been doing a lot of things to try to help to mental health our student. Is that effective? The second question is, I echo Dr. Mick's concern about you know, our teachers. Um, and I know that the school district has been doing a wonderful job of trying to provide COVID testing for teacher. So I just want to know, can we describe what kind of uh, testing for our teacher right now? Is it in line with the other school district? And also, when should we expect the uh, COVID vaccine for teacher to be applied, to, um, to be administrated uh, come, uh, to all the teacher? Thank you. So you had two separate questions. The first one is on mental health which I'll let uh, Mrs. Ingalls uh, share on that piece and we'll share a little bit more on, on where we are with the vaccines, our process and comparisons to other districts, okay? Mrs. Ingalls, good, good evening. Good evening, thank you very much, Director Lung for, for these questions. Regarding mental health, uh, we know that in previous board meetings, we have talked about all of the ways our counselors, social workers, psychologists, and school staff are engaging with students to monitor concerns around their social emotional well being and safety. And um, Dr. Crawford and I in December looked into the data that we have available to us to see if there's any trends that show significant increases. And so we looked at the number of suicide assessments that are completed in the school district by our counselors, social workers, and psychologists, and those numbers remain stable. So in this school year, we have not seen an increase in the number of suicide assessments that we would typically do. We also checked in with Douglas County to ask about um, the numbers that they have regarding uh, death from suicide. And we all agree that any death by suicide is, is one too many. The data that they have also shows uh, no trend, no significant increase um, in the age group of 10 to 19 uh, for death by suicide. There may be a slight increase in older age groups, but not for the younger age groups. We also uh, have regular communication with the coroner for Douglas County. As you know, we have a crisis team that uh, works with the coroner when needed. And the coroner anecdotally has also reported that they are seeing actually a decrease overall in all age groups in um, suicide in Douglas County. All right. And Mr. Weiss, um, yeah. I know you talked about the vaccination earlier. Um, this kind of strays a little bit from our topic, but I'll let you give us a two minute quick response to that question. Yep, so, you know, when you talk about how we compare to other districts, we would, I would say we are in line and we'll have the ability to give access with multiple area regional hospitals, venues, uh, COVID Check Colorado and others to give access to our teachers. 
Um, we are getting our staff vaccinated starting this week. That'll continue in the weeks to come. So uh, I will say this, I, you know, Cherry Creek was first to come out. And that process of how that happened, it was in a text message and a, you know, professional working piece that wasn't about, you know, systems that really, there was availability and, and uh, that organization reached out and they were able to start that process. But what it did is open the door and help all of the agencies prioritize, set systems. Many are still creating their systems. Um, in that, everyone else now is continuing to set this up. We have worked tirelessly, um, even over break, to create these systems, open it up and start the process. And, and you know, where, where I see us, uh, I think we're in a good spot, not only where we are to get our staff prioritized, but continue the work and control our work of getting our staff who are working with students and teachers um, vaccinated. And those partnerships with these agencies and then the changes that we're gonna face as the availability of vaccines, new vaccines come out and everything else, uh, we'll be able to continue. And I think that ability to continue, even in the face of change and decisions that happen to us, we'll be able to advance and, and keep that going. So uh, I will say this, kudos to our staff. We had individuals reaching out to all of our agencies, um, who we have with Kaiser, Cigna, uh, Centura, Health One, uh, again, Colorado COVID check, multiple ones say, what's your system, what's our process, what can we do to not only have one partnership, to have multiple access points and continue that. So uh, I will give uh, a shout out to our school nurses, Lisa Cantor, Nancy, HR, uh, all of our groups, Matt, uh, and others in the work of reaching out to multiple um, groups. And to be quite honest, a lot of the time is going to be dependent on how many vaccines come in, the process of who qualifies, and then getting the email that you get it. But we're also working with our staff to, to also say who has it and help them get it and also uh, build better supports because it opens up doors. When more people are vaccinated, it, open up, it opens up doors and it allows our decision making with finances, resources to shift and allows more of that responsiveness. So um, we want to promote that. We want to advocate. We want to build safety and options and, and put our staff and teachers uh, to the forefront. So I feel really good about where we are and the steps going into this week and weeks to come. Very good. Dr. Meek? So I, I kind of want to expand on uh, Director Graziano's idea. And um, I think we probably will be getting a presentation in the future on the new uh, federal stimulus dollars and how those will be allocated out in regards to um, extended hours or um, summer programs, you know, different kinds of programs. And I think tutoring might be one of those. But when it comes to students, you know, I've, I've given so much thought about my vote towards our volunteer hour requirements that we did away with this year. In hindsight, I wish I would not have supported that because I think keeping those high school students engaged in volunteer activities such, such as tutoring is a way that really would help with mental health and connectedness and everything. And so if you, know, you do look into programs of developing a tutoring program, I would love to volunteer to be on any kind of task force or anything like that. But I think the more we can engage our, our high school students and our middle school students um, and making those connections and helping their peers, you know, I think there are all these benefits to doing that as well. So anyway, I just kind of wanted to bring up the federal stimulus money because there might be money to help support programming around some of these areas. And I also wanted to say I would love to volunteer on any kind of group talking about that. And kudos to our uh, CFR, Chief Financial Officer, Kate Kataska. Um, as we started hearing about the stimulus money coming, it's roughly, they say on the average of what you would get in, in your Title IX funding. She's already throw ideas forward to myself and others with cabinet to talk about how we could have more tutoring, um, intensive programs and possibly work over the summer. So she would like to advocate to us and to others to possibly bring that forward. So uh, each of your ideas, so I want you to know that there's already been thoughts around that, and we'll take that back, continue to grow those and expand those and see what we can do. I don't wanna, again, paint a picture that it's uh, um, already 
set up and well done, but uh, similar types of ideas and uh, advocating for, for our students and the possibility. Very and good. I will say community service, what we could control and what now we can create, I think community service says it, it's volunteer piece. I think we'll, we have people that step up and we'll continue to have our kids and students are amazing. I think we can get that and, and we present the right way to engage um, and we gain a lot of times more in our community service acts than we give. And so I think our, our potential of building that uh, could be there. So we'll definitely look at that. Very good. Director Holtzman. Okay, <clears throat> not to belabor the, the tutoring and the volunteer efforts, um, but I will bring up again, and, and it's been a few months ago that this was brought up, so I think it was before you're in your current position, but there are volunteer organizations offering things to students. Um, for instance, there's professional students at CU Anschutz that I know are providing tutoring to some of our neighboring districts. Um, so I'd be happy to provide that information as you're considering all the options. Thank you for doing that. Um, and then what I really wanted to say very quickly is that when, when you're talking to us about the, the grade scale change in the high schools and the, the, how it was referred to and I, it's accurate failure rates, that's about the grades. Um, I think it's just a little deceptive and probably doesn't give our students and our staff um, and our families enough credit. In other words, when our principals, when our secondary principals and our directors of schools and you and all of our staff are looking at those, I just wanna make sure people understand that the reason we're doing that is to identify where our students are at and what they need. Um, and I really appreciate the consideration and thought that went into not penalizing students um, who might be having a more difficult time this year. I would go so far as to say all of our students are facing different challenges and more challenges than they ever have before, including the rest of us, some to different degrees. Um, but I, I really appreciate that that was recognized. I know I personally had several students contact me saying they were doing everything they could. They were working as hard as they could and it's, it's hard. So um, considering, like you mentioned, that that does affect their life. Um, it's on their transcripts, just like all the other students in the world. So they're not in any different situation, but I appreciate that in Douglas County School District, we looked at that and we recognized that it's not a failure of our students. Um, you know, maybe some of them could have worked harder, but it, it's something that they needed. And I really just wanted to express appreciation for that. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Director Holtzman. All right, directors, and uh, Mr. Weiss, anything else on under your superintendent updates at nope. this time? All right, directors, any other questions for? All right, so directors, I'm, I'm gonna make um, a suggestion and then we would, we would need to make a motion to adjust our agenda since we're well, just about an hour behind. Um, what I would like to suggest is that we would table uh, the Read Act update to our next meeting on the 18th. And I would, because it's time sensitive, I'd like to bump up the um, information about the superintendent search. Um, and then I see we also have the compensation system uh, discussion as well. So um, I'm gonna suggest that we <laughs> have the, let's see, let's, let's table the Read Act update Let's bump up the uh, conversation about the compensation system and the search updates, and then we'll do interim superintendent goals as kind of our final item uh, before our board reports. Was that as clear as mud? All right, so let's start with just modifying our agenda to table the READ Act update. Is there a motion to do that? So moved. Second. Okay, motion made and seconded to move our Read Act update to our, specifically to our next meeting. Motion made and seconded. Let's vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. All right. And then let's, um, let's go ahead and talk about, or I'd like to modify and have us have the compensation system question now, and then um, immediately after that to move into the superintendent search update. So the motion is to move number 20 up now and 
um, 21 after that. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Holtzman, second by Lung. Any further discussion? All right, let's vote. Chancho Shore. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. All right. So we're moving on to then the review of resolution and the transition to a new employee compensation system. As some of you recall, on December uh, 2018, the board approved an employee compensation values resolution, resolution, which was followed with a resolution on March 10th to actually begin the transition to a new employee compensation system. Uh, due to the implications of the pandemic and the economic forecast, we then voted in April to suspend the directives uh, and specifically stated that we would review that suspension in our January meetings. So at this time, that's what we are doing. Um, I don't know if um, Mrs. Thompson is on. Is she on at this time, Mr. Blair? Yes, Thank you. Happy so, New Year. Yes, I am. Happy New Year to you, Ms. Thompson, as well. So I'm going to let you kind of make some opening remarks, and uh, as well as I know you have some uh, presentation just to help us get our head back around this whole notion of compensation. So thank you for being here tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you. So yes, we'll just take a little brief walk through the past here. Um, and all the, the great work that we have done so far in preparing um, and progressing through the work and developing a new compensation plan. So um, if you would move to the next slide, that would be great, thank you. So it's always important to understand the why behind our work and grounding our work and, and what we do. So pleased to share that this work aligns directly with multiple things across the district. First of all, with our board end statements around outstanding educators and staff, specifically around our recruitment and uh, retainment of our wonderful employees from every employee group, from teachers all the way to our classified staff. Um, also around the value of our staff. So even though over the last year we've had to pause on this due to things outside of our control, we do want to emphasize as a district how very much so we believe in this work and we value our employees. And it's our ultimate goal to revise and create a better system over time for our employees in terms of pay and compensation. Next slide, please. Also with that, um, through our um, very intentional development of our strategic plan, there's multiple themes that relate to this work as well. One is around theme three, positive and supportive culture, specifically around what those, what those things are that we believe in and our collective commitments. Again, it goes back to not only this theme, but our board goals around valuing employees and finding ways to show um, how we honor them. And one is through that collective compensation piece. Next slide, please. And also, I know that we have seen this uh, very much so over the last uh, year, it's our theme six. So this is that recruitment and retention and development of our high quality, amazing employees. Specifically, this is around this, you'll also see this in our board resolution, development and recommendation of a predictable schedule that recognizes multiple things along with is comparable and is regionally um, competitive um, progressively. I know we've talked a lot about that over the last year or so. Next slide, please. So um, as Director Ray recently mentioned, last spring, specifically, I believe it's our April 7th board meeting, uh, we had to um, pause and suspend temporarily our board resolutions uh, is specifically related to our compensation project. So these two are live links here for anyone who wants to read specifically. Um, but the first one is on our compensation values and resolution, which looks very similar to theme six of our strategic plan. It talks about making sure that we are recognizing the compensation of all of our employee groups, including our teachers. And then the next resolution from March of this past year also talks about ensuring that we continue to engage with our employee groups around this process 
and that we are aligning to that other resolution um, in 2018, which is right above this resolution, and that it is um, the, the work that we are developing in our new compensation system is fiscally responsible, it's sustainable, and that um, we can do so in a phased in approach and that it's endorsed by our superintendent. And again, you can revisit these links here to find even more detail about it. Next slide, please. So the overview is just a brief snapshot of what has occurred over the last school year in terms of the 1920 school year. Please know that you can access all of this historical information in our board presentations that our compensation team and our finance team were a part of throughout the last school year. Part of that was celebrating and thanking all of our licensed employees for um, helping work with us around turning in your transcript and experience data, which we are now pleased to share. You can access and continue to update at any time so that we can utilize this as we look at our resolutions when our board approves when we are ready to continue with that based upon a variety of factors. Also throughout 1920, we worked in collaboration with employee council, various board committees to gather input and our overall employee groups. Uh, inclusive of that included looking at metro area district salary structures, looking at a market analysis as of the 1920 school year, doing some surveys and input session results, multiple input sessions, including uh, superintendent outreach meetings. Greenway worked with us around a licensed employee survey. And also we developed several different example structures that we could look at and moving forward as potential options. Paired with that is the importance of costing. So as we look at our board resolutions, it's important that uh, we are looking at that sustainability and fiscal responsibility um, and where we're at as a district in terms of ensuring that we can sustain that over time. Also with that, as we look at last year and rolling into this school year is not only the budgetary impact, but what that looks like in terms of enrollment as related to the budget. I'd love to invite Ms. Katoska to share any additional information relative to that piece. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and as she mentioned, you know, part of this is ensuring that it's fin financially su sustainable. And as, as we move to any of these new proposed scenarios, it's not a one-time cost. So these are setting up structures that will last in perpetuity. And so it's really important that we're not just analyzing what the single year or um, initial year cost is, but really looking at how those those costs scale over time and layering that against our um, different long-term financial forecast and enrollment forecast to ensure we're, we're planning for um, what those staffing models will look like going into the future. So I've really enjoyed um, you know, the partnership with, with the HR team and my, my first few months here and in getting to know the background here um, and really do value the the, the value that is placed on ensuring that this is not a, a one-year switch or decision that we're looking at, but really looking out to the long-term and ensuring that it's something that we can carry on for, for many, many years into the future. Thank you. Next slide, please. And lastly, in terms of next steps, so Pleased to share that as we look at our next steps and moving forward, all of the steps that we are taking currently and to continue um, include all of the things that relate back to our strategic plan theme. So we're being very mindful to ensure that our work is very purposeful. First of all, we will continue in HR to analyze, correct, and apply, uh, and apply employee uh, processes throughout the district. So things that have been lost uh, in the past years, we're now bringing back over time. One example was the transcript um, collection process. And um, as Ms. Kataska shared, we'll continue to navigate our current um, needs as a district. So we have not only operational priorities, we have financial and academic priorities, all relative to our challenges um, during the pandemic. Paired with that, as Ms. Kataska just shared, is ensuring that, that fiscal sustainability. So looking at some of those examples from the past, from those example pay structures from last spring, 
Some of them were in the $20 million range for one year. Um, there's a lot of other underlying details relative to that, but that just goes to the um, confirmation of that sustainability over time. And along with that, we definitely value our employees and we're finding not only through um, compensation now and through the future, but also finding other ways to value our employees. Um, for example, providing opportunities through our wellness and, and things like that. So um, we are committed to our employees, to every employee group. We believe in this work. And this is something that, you know, we definitely have intentionality to continue once the timing and the budgetary needs are in the right time. So with that, we are, uh, we've concluded and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Thompson and also Ms. Kataska uh, for that overview. So what I'm hearing from both of you is that your recommendation for the board is really to continue to suspend this plan of transition um, until, as you stated, uh, both of you stated, until we can really forge through the pandemic and understand where we are budgetarily as we look into our future. Um, do you have a target, Mrs. Thompson, in terms of when we should come back and say, okay, now it's time, you may understand, you know, we'll get through the budgetary process, we'll uh, you know, recommend a, a budget for next year uh, in June. Are you thinking that our timeline for revisiting this recommendation for a transition not be reviewed again until the fall of 21, or do you have a recommendation for that? Thank you for that question. Um, one, I would want to ensure that um, I can have further conversation with Mr. Wise about that and Ms. Katoska, but uh, yes. So I would say at least in the fall, uh, we wanna make sure that we can truly understand where we're at with the budget um, knowing that we are hitting the season of benefits, among other things, and, and enrollment and staffing. So uh, at least the fall, yes. Um, Mr. Wise, any other information that you want to share and or Ms. Kataska relative to timelines? Ms. Kataska, you're first, and then Mr. Wise, go ahead. I agree with Ms. Thompson. I think, um, you know, planning for the 21-22 school year is going to have challenges all, all its own. And our first priority is gonna be restoring um, salary cuts that were made heading into this year for low days and other, other salary reductions. And I think it's really important that we restore first before changing a structure out from, from under our staff. So I think we'd be looking for implementation in the 22-23 school year. Uh, and, and, and as you mentioned, bringing this back up in the fall to have, have these more detailed conversations when we have a, a firmer outlook on what that year is going to look like and, and, and beyond. Um, and then also, you know, the conversations around future um, bond and mill levies are always out there. And I think, you know, absent a dedicated funding stream, it could be really tough to implement a change of this magnitude without either dedicated funding sources at the state level or locally through um, a bond or mill or through a mill levy. Thank you, Ms. Kataska. Mr. Weiss, anything you want to add to that? Couldn't have said it better. The, the process to review, I think, should be ongoing. So I think in the fall to continue to look at, I think we need to call out what are our needs? Um, how do we meet those needs? What's it going to cost? Um, what are our priorities? I think that goes right in line with the bond and mill to really call out uh, what are our deliverables, but then also what are our needs and, and uh, looking at how can we get to that point? We all want this. It's a target. But then we have to say, what's it going to take to get there? So. Very good. Director's questions regarding the recommendation and or the overview that was provided for us. Any questions? Director Lung? Oh, thank you very much for the hard work. I know this is very difficult of trying to um, navigate during the pandemic's fund cutting while trying to maintain a equitable pay you know, for our employee. Um, I would like to know, you said that you consult the employee council you did take a vote, what kind of general feedback do they give to you? And besides the employee council, have you consulted any other um, employee professional organizations? Uh, what kind of partnership that we have to make sure that our 8,300 employee have um, adequate input to this process? Um, and also, 
we know that during um, the early uh, years of uh, 2000, we have a fees um, of uh, pay that create inequality because the later higher people getting more money than the people that are so loyal to DCSD. Are, are they not being resolved? Because I think we are supposed to uh, fix the issues with uh, the new uh, pay structure. Thank you for that question, Director Long. So there's multiple layers to that. Your first question was around um, input processes, not only working with employee council, but other organizations. Um, in terms of employee council, uh, in the um, information shared during the 1920 school year, we did hold multiple input sessions with our licensed employee group all throughout the month of October of the 1920 school year. Um, hosting, I want by feeder, um, multiple opportunities, also sending out a survey to all in licensed employees, gathering their input in various layers of this process. Please know we are not done with gathering input. Uh, as we continue forward, when that right time is, as decided upon our board and, and Mr. Wise, we would um, ensure that there are multiple opportunities for our employees' voices to be heard and for us to hear their thoughts and gather input on that, depending upon what phase we are in. Not only is that for teachers, but as we progress at the right time through the next phases, including our other employee groups, they would have a voice in that process as well. Um, in terms of pay structures and where different employees are, um, we continue to look at that data and we continue to um, ensure that we are um, being fair in the way that we onboard people and um, do our salary process for new hires to be as um, aligned at and fair as, as possible to recognize those currently in our system amongst those that are the new hires. And to echo that, you know, this fall we've brought forward the budget and tried to share where we are current states create understanding. In the board meetings ahead, um, CFO Katasco will be sharing even more. It's gonna create understanding, where are we? This is a impact year with COVID on finances. And when you look at our enrollment numbers decreasing and continuing impact, it's not this just this year, it will impact us next year. So I think sharing information, creating understanding on top of getting feedback and looking at timing is part of a work that we've started it's gonna continue and gonna to need to continue into next year as we talked. Um, Mr. Wise, I also want to thank you for your participation and monthly engagement in employee council in which we have a meeting coming up this Monday. And I just wanna thank you for providing that open forum for our employee council members to not only hear updates regarding everything going on in our district and have a voice in that process, but also um, in bringing up any topic for discussion. So just wanna thank you for your engagement with that. Very good, all right, Director. So um, at this point, we, I will entertain a motion to um, again, suspend the directives of the resolution that's titled transitioning to a new compensation system until it can be reviewed again in the fall of 21. Is there a motion? Director A, I would make that motion. Um, just clarifying for the board, this doesn't indicate that our values have changed. Um, the board's never made that decision. And I know that for me, um, the values we've stated are still held very strongly. And I, I think that I can say that for every board member. Um, and it's supported by our strategic plan. So it's, it's not a change in that, it's just, Unfortunately, due to the situation we find ourselves in, and I appreciate the difficult recommendation that our staff has given us tonight, um, I do make that motion that we would suspend it for now. And, and I remind me the date that you said. Um, uh, fall of 21. Fall of 21, thank you. Motion made by Director Holtzman to suspend and review in fall 21. Is there a second? Second. Second, further discussion, and I think Director Holtzman captured that well. Um, all the systems are in place for us to continue to value and prioritize this work. Um, and I certainly appreciate, Ms. Thompson, the work that has led up to this to where 
it's really clear to me that because of that, it would be very effective and efficient for us to pick up right where we left off uh, because of all the structures that have been in place up to this point. So, uh, Director Meek, discussion, comments? I guess just a comment. Um, there are non-monetary ways to demonstrate value, you know, for our employees. And I just really want to encourage us to continue to try to solicit ideas from our employees as to ways that we can um, demonstrate value that are outside of uh, additional compensation scale. And I think we'll have all kinds of feedback loops ahead of us, you know, throughout the spring, um, whether you're talking about feedback on the budget or feedback on a superintendent search, et cetera. But if we can continue to engage with our employees and try to look at non-monetary ways or other ways we can demonstrate how much we value them, I really want to encourage that. Very good. Director Long? I just want to clarify um, what I'm voting for. So we are suspending the current uh, pay erosion system until fall of um, 2021. But during the suspensions, HR will still, I mean, DCSD will still continue to engage the employee groups um, to get the feedback. Um, and when we, when we resume um, these discussions in fall, we will then be present a new plan at that time, or in fall 2021, we are authorized to resume this process. So Director Long, to answer your first question, it's we're not suspending the current compensation system. That's not true. What we're suspending is a resolution that this board passed that gave a directive to our system to transition to a new compensation system. So we're basically suspending our own resolution. As you heard Ms. Kataska talk about, certainly there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of what employee compensation will look like for next year, whether that's recovering the furlough days or recovering some of the things that our employees have, have um, incurred because of the budget cuts that we um, experienced this year. So, so this is certainly not saying that this is driving what will happen to employee compensation for 2021. It's simply suspending our resolution for transitioning to a new compensation system. So the, so the motion is um, this was suspending the March uh, 2020, March 10, 2020 resolutions. So just as it is right now, right? That's correct. That's okay. the motion, the mo Thank you. yes. Any other discussion or questions? All right, seeing none, let's vote. Chancho Shore? Aye. Graziano? Aye. Her Hansen? Aye. Holtzman? I vote aye. Did we have a second? We did. Did we have a second? Thank you for that. Okay, Graziano sorry, second. Yep. I just didn't see it. <laughs> Holtzman, go ahead. Uh, I vote aye. Alung? Aye. Meek? Aye. Ray, aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Thank you, Ms. Kataskin. We'll look forward to the continued journey ahead. So um, we'll see you guys next month or next uh, in a couple of weeks. All right, board. Next on our agenda as we modified our agenda is to look at an update regarding the superintendent search firms. Um, had the pleasure of working with Director Long and Director Chancho Shore um, as a subgroup of this board to um, interview and talk with all the search firms who had returned a response to our request for proposal. Um, our criteria as we were interviewing, and I'm just gonna list it real quickly for the public, but we were looking at what the crucial elements of the search model that the firm was proposing. We were looking for their recruitment methods. We were looking at their flexibility of being able to customize the support to our unique needs. We looked at whether they had a research-based process and how they vetted candidates. And then we also looked at their process for background checks 
and ensuring that there would be no, that, ensuring that they had a, a very rigorous process to reveal any kind of concerning info about a candidate. And then finally, we looked at the engagement strategies that they employed to work with all our multiple group constituents and stakeholders. So that was really the six criteria that we prioritized and we interviewed uh, each of these companies, each of these firms to begin coming back to you to make a recommendation. And as you know, um, based on the timeline that we approved at two meetings ago, uh, we're right where we need to be as far as this is our time to recommend moving forward with a search firm. The next step after that then is to draft an agreement with that search firm as well as then to work with that search firm to begin um, having us have some conversation to begin defining what those engagement strategies will look like. So based on that, um, well, I'm gonna pause there. I'm gonna first of all tell you that based on those criteria, Chancha Shore and Director Lung and I um, are recommending Frederick Andrews as the search firm that we think we should pursue an agreement with based on how well they met the criteria that I just listed. Um, we also have from Frederick Andrews, the consultant who would be working with us, Tim Demers. I'll introduce and allow him to answer questions in just a moment, but I, I wanna pause and have Director Lung or Director Chancho Shore jump in with any kind of comments you might wanna make about the process for our selection and our recommendation and or specifically why Frederick Andrews surfaced as the one that we are recommending. So, uh, Director Chancha Shore, do you wanna lead us off? Sure. Thank you. We did, we interviewed throughout the day and it was an interesting process. We had some very specific questions that we asked for different firms and then a rating process for each question to um, identify the, um, whether or not the questions were addressed well um, the, the firm that Mr. Demers represented uh, caught my attention through a couple of specific things that he said. Um, one was that they implemented in 2009 a diversity and inclusion div division program um, that I, I found really interesting that they reach out their marketing campaign made for, they identify what kind of search we want and then they create the um, the search based on our needs and identify our needs. They have a recruiting strategy that um, sounded very interesting that I would just ask him to elaborate on. It was different than other um, firms that we spoke with. And it was interesting because it was different. Um, I'll just say one more thing and allow Director Lung to speak, but I also liked very, very, very much that Mr. Demers is part of our community. Um, I felt like that gave us a level of buy-in that was different than other firms across uh, the nation or the country. Um, to have students, children in our community going to our schools makes it incredibly important um, to find and help us find the exact right match. I could say more, but I'll defer to Director Lung. Very good, thank you, Director Chacha Shore. Director Lung, anything you would like to add? Well, Dr. Chacha Shore always says so well. <laughs> I, a couple of things I want to add is, not only we have a local person that it will be a DCSD uh, a parent and, and the, the firm that we hire will be moving to Colorado. So it's a local firm and um, also, they are very willing to work with us um, in any way that, um, you know, they use their expertise, but they will work with our process. Um, and also um, in terms of um, the fee structure and things like that, they uh, come up with a very, very comparative uh, uh, fee schedule that will work with us um, also. And uh, we all, I mean, I'm always watching, you know, we're always watching, you know, the taxpayers' money. Um, I think um, the more important thing is that um, I being in the business world, 
um, um, the way that they doing the search, uh, that they are very specialized in uh, searching for a, a corporate person, and uh, which may be a little bit different from what we get used to. But there's another route of uh, that we could take um, to find the best people for our school district. Um, that's all, right. all I wanted. Thank you, Director Lung. And I'm going to go back to the Mr. Demers. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome you um, to our board meeting. As uh, would would just have you maybe give us a two minute spiel on who you are, Tim, and why. Um, I know we we know that you are one of the um, managers of Frederick Andrews, and maybe just uh, give us a quick synopsis of who Frederick Andrews is as well. So sure. welcome. Absolutely. Thank you for thank you for letting me meet with you guys, and I look forward to telling you guys a little bit about me. So our firm is based out of California originally. Uh, we, although we were moving to Colorado, we were supposed to move last year in June to Colorado, uh, but unfortunately, uh, COVID put a monkey wrench in that uh, for us. So we ended up uh, not moving yet. So I moved out first to start our office to move our office here. Our office is now located at the uh, DTC. Uh, and I'm kind of setting it up there. Uh, I'm the managing partner. The rest of the team from California will be moving in and out uh, by the end of the uh, middle of uh, this year. Uh, our firm started off as a traditional retained search firm. So we are, most of our uh, clients initially were corporations, uh, large corporations. We worked with almost every Fortune 10 company out there. Uh, but in, in 2012, as I mentioned, um, we moved into more of working into the MPO world as well. I got involved heavily in the schools uh, uh, process and, and education in general. So everything from K through 12 and higher education as well. And when I first kind of got into the industry, I looked at it from a perspective of what, uh, what administrative budgets were being used uh, and, and what people were charging for administrative budgets. Uh, and we looked at and kind of created a plan that wasn't based off of uh, our traditional search fee that we would be charging uh, our normal clients outside of uh, the education industry. But we took our, our philosophies and our same skill sets that we had done in the regular uh, industries and moved them into education. Uh, one of the things that we do that's a little bit different is that we are a traditional retained firm in the sense of we actually go after the candidates directly. We don't, we will never post your job on a job board and just send you a candidate that we get from a job board. We feel like you could do that on your own and you really don't need us for that. Uh, what we do is we actually customize the search based off of what you're looking for. So one of the questions that was asked to me in the interview process is, well, there's two other uh, districts in Colorado looking for superintendents. Are we going to find that as an issue? And my response to that is that the, the superintendent we're looking for has nothing to do with the superintendent for Jeffco or, or uh, DPS, uh, we are looking for the one that's going to fit Douglas County specifically, and that's what that's kind of what we we're going to structure this search as. I'm actually in Douglas County, so being the fact that I'm in Parker, uh, my son is going to be going to Iron Horse next year. Uh, it, it is a it's a place that I want to kind of first just make sure that I take care of, but second of all, I want this person to be the right person for. For, for generations to come because this is the, the district I'm part of. So I, it was kind of, a, it was kind of a, an opportunity for me to give back to the community and also have a stake in kind of the next leadership for the community. So that's kind of why I reached out. And, and when I spoke with Dr. Ray and the team there, it, it, was, it was really from a perspective of how can we work this together as a team to make sure we find the right person and not have the same situation that happened previously. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Demers, for that uh, for, for that overview. So, board, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask any questions. Obviously, um, this is not an interview, Mr. Demers, because um, there's been a subgroup of us that have done that. So, um, you're kind of phrase your questions if uh, you want towards us in terms of the recommendation we're bringing to you, or if there's other burning questions you didn't hear from uh, Mr. Demers' overview that you would like to know. Uh, so, any questions, Director Graziano? Hi, good, good evening, Tim. Um, I guess a uh, question I have, and again, is not since this, we're not interviewing you at all, I'm just curious because I wasn't in those meetings. Maybe if you could um, just walk us through 
the, your, at a high level, the process that you follow, of a successful superintendent search that you've run and, and what that looks like and what, what's unique about what you, you, you did during that process? Not a problem. I'd be happy to. Uh, so the way that our process works is, is initially what we do is we have the, the client interview, which is going to happen uh, after we're done with this meeting. We're going to schedule time with all the stakeholders uh, and including you obviously involved and then any faculty or and then also create surveys for, for parents as well to kind of give them an opportunity to kind of get a consensus viewpoint on how uh, we want this, this superintendent to be. Once we uh, tabulate that all together, put it together, uh, what we do is we actually structure a recruiting strategy plan. Uh, so what we do is I will put together a plan or my team will put together a plan and I'll present it to the board to explain exactly who we're gonna go after, where we're gonna go after them and how we're gonna do that process. Uh, again, our search system is not posting in, in publications or posting on, online. Ours is actually going directly after uh, superintendents that are currently doing the job now uh, that are, we're not, are not going to be on job boards, are not disgruntled, not upset. So we reach out to them. We actually have marketing campaigns that reach out to them directly to get them to respond back to us. Uh, that's not in a way of a job posting type of scenario. And similar to what they were saying as it relates to the inclusion and diversity, we actually have programs specifically meant, uh, meant to entice that group as well to respond back to us. Our research analysts will speak. Uh, will initially identify all the names of people we're going to be reaching out to. My recruiting manager or myself will take those names uh, initially and reach out to them. Uh, we'll we'll be uh, reaching out to them through a number of different methods. We have we have an internal database. We have a proprietary database as well that actually tracks people from what location to location, so we know where they are, um, and, and it has all their information as far as email addresses, phone numbers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll reach out to them directly. But once we have uh, some, some candidates that are in the, the pipeline, what we'll do from that point is we start the vetting process and we actually start looking for any reason that they don't fit the role, any reason that can give us any red flags whatsoever about, the, uh, about them. Uh, then what we do is we put them through uh, a, a preliminary background check. So we don't do the full black background check until we get a little closer and you guys start to like them a little bit when you, you, you show us interest which candidate you're into. Uh, but the initial background check will, will ultimately just be a quick background as far as criminals concerned to make sure that there's no uh, criminal history or anything along those lines. It'll also check their education to ensure that their education is, at, uh, it is what it says it's going to be. Um, once the interview process starts with you guys, uh, with the team there, uh, then we, we kind of move the, the ball a little further. As we get closer to the offer negotiation stage, we will present a... Uh, full background check, which will include social media, uh, uh, social media check, it will include uh, et drug test, everything else that would be needed, or anything in specific, like I told like the team, we will customize it towards what you guys need. So if you guys would like it to be more specific in certain areas, and I know there were some questions in, in, in the past of, of what had happened uh, with, a previous, with previous superintendents, but this is what we would do is we would uh, actually present you a significantly different uh, uh, background check that'll pretty much cover anything you could possibly think of. And and that's and then once we do that, we will help you with the negotiation of the offer. Uh, once we help the negotiation with the offer, we ensure the candidate will accept before the offer goes out officially. Uh, once the candidate is verbally accepted, we'll give you guys the information to say the candidate has accepted uh, the position. Now, when you write up the actual job offer, all you need to do then is it's more of a formality to get them to sign it. Uh, we follow up through the process through their uh, resignation process. We help them through that process to ensure that they don't take any counter offers. Uh, and then we also help with them as far as guiding them into the to the to the district. And then we follow up uh, 30, 60, 90, and then six months and nine months in, in, up to the first year. So we follow up every uh, once once a month for the first three months, and then three every three months after that for the first year to ensure that it is correct. Uh, if there was any discrepancy, which we are I've never really run into, but if there is a discrepancy as far as anything fraudulent that's identified in the first year of, of this, uh, of, the, of the candidate's placement, uh, we will obviously replace the candidate, but we also understand that a, uh, a superintendent, if, if there was an issue, would not be uh, obviously removed quickly. So we would honor our, our replacement throughout the, the whole time so long as there's it was identified in the first year. 
So the process is pretty simple from the point of we, we take all of the information from you uh, and all the other constituents and stakeholders, compile that in, build a recruiting strategy, present that recruiting strategy to you to ensure that you're okay with the way we're going to go about this. And then we start going after. Very good. Thank you, Tim. Any other, any other questions for Tim regarding the process, regarding um, our process and in, in recommending them? I would also just um, um, say that Tim is also very in tune to our situation where we want to also look at internal candidates in our district as well. So this by no means is intended to be an aggressive search um, nationally, it's, it's really, as, as Tim will present to us, it's really recruiting the best people and put in front of us for consideration, including our internal leaders as well. So I'll just put that plug in. Director Hanson, I saw your hand up. That was my question. I had specifically asked at each of the interviews um, that we ask the, the companies how they would ensure that we were including all of our incredible DCSD current employees in this process. And um, David, you, you generally answered, but um, if you have anything to add, Mr. DeMars, I would certainly be, um, be happy to hear it. Absolutely, and thank you for the question. Yeah, yes, uh, if, if there is a candidate presented directly from, uh, from the district themselves, uh, we would treat them very similar in the sense of as far as background checks, as far as uh, vetting them and making sure that they're part of the system. We would treat them the same way uh, as we will all the other candidates as well. Our goal is to find the right candidate. If they're already there at DCSD, it's perfect. <laughs> but if they're not, uh, we'll find them somewhere else. Um, and, and as I mentioned to the team there, if if we did find someone who's already currently in uh, the system now in the district now we would renegotiate we would lower our fee to to ensure that uh, that that would be uh, more you know more applicable to, to that stage because we're not doing the same amount of work we'd be doing for somebody outside of the, of the district very good that sounds wonderful thank you thank you director Hansen all right any other questions so board uh, tonight, we're really just simply taking action to move forward with drawing up an agreement with uh, Franklin, I'm sorry, <laughs> Frederick Andrews. Um, so that's our motion. We will again be able to see the agreement at our next meeting on January 18th um, as probably part of our consent agenda. So with that, so is I'll there move to the motions. Okay, so Director Lung is moving that we draw an agreement up with Frederick Andrews for our recruitment Correct. firm. Is there a second? Second. Second, Director Chancha Shore. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, let's vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. And that passes unanimously. Um, Tim, our next step is, and board, we've, I threw out some dates to you, is that we've na we, we're landing on next Tuesday at five o'clock to have a remote meeting with you to begin kicking us off in terms of laying the groundwork. So uh, I assume, I know that was a date that, was, that you were available, so just go ahead and book that on the calendar. We'll look forward to catching up with you again next Tuesday at five o'clock. All right, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. All right. Next on our agenda then is to come back. We've given Mr. Wise a little bit of time to rest and relax for, for a few minutes. We're going to bring him back um, to begin talking about his performance goals for the remainder of the, of the year. And I would just editorialize it a little bit to say that um, the way these pieces go together, we, we've set our end statements, and that really is the destination that the board is really defined as being why we exist, where we're headed, what our true north, what is our compass, and so those are our end statements, and then we have certainly narrowed those end statements down to say, okay, we want to examine these areas a little more critically this year, and those are the ones we identify. We identified three, Mr. Weiss and his staff, have already laid out some plans for how they're gonna monitor and help us see more clearly where we are with that destination goal that we set. 
Then we have a strategic plan that actually maps out the road, the, 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 the map to the destination, if you will. And, and it identifies, as we saw tonight with our HR presentation, identifies all the stops and all the places that we want to spend time with to develop as we go along on this journey towards our destination. Um, and then our interim superintendent, I guess I would use the analogy that he's the bus driver. Um, he's the one that's driving the tour bus on the strategic plan road to get us to our destination. And so his goals tonight really are specifically to what he plans to do as our tour guide on the road to that destination of the board in statement. So with that, um, interim superintendent wise, I'll let, turn it over to you. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I think when we, when we talk about that alignment, um, first and foremost, it helps everyone get a better idea of who I am in this role. Uh, the alignment to our in statements, uh, to our board focus for this year, to our strategic plan. You know, Douglas County is a great place. We've done a lot of great work. The strategic plan uh, has been a, a huge beacon to guide us. And even when we look at where we are uh, in this year of COVID, there's been a lot of work happening towards that. So, you know, as I start thinking about uh, who I am, it's really reflective of the ownership of who we are as Douglas County. So I wanna talk about that purposeful alignment, those goals and those action statements that I think in this, it, it will quantify not only a goal, but put towards uh, what's that mean and look like? What are we trying to accomplish? What are we doing? So when you look at uh, our, our work within this, it really goes back to some of the similar alignment. And, you know, in times of change, you have to tend to culture and climate. You have to get back to who are we, what's that look like, feel like, sound like. And I think in this process, going back to that alignment of, of our ends, along with our, our focus within the, the, the board, really taking a look at that purpose of focus of a caring and safe environment. You know, of uh, engaging people, of looking at our, our students, our employees, our teachers, our parents, and our community. Number one, uh, I want to continue to be visible. Uh, what's that look like? How are we accessible? Where are we a part of meetings? And in this process, uh, how do we do that within our community? We started some town halls and really want to continue that even more into the spring. So having a town hall at least once a month, moving forward with students and, and community to get feedback, to have focus, to share information and collect more information to, to move our work together and build more understanding, collaboration and, and feedback. You know, the other part of that is we've been attending a number of level meetings. I've worked within department meetings and listened, try to share vision, set the plan and really set priorities of next steps. The same is true with our principal meetings, uh, being at our level meetings, being a part of regional, um, really trying to get to know principals. Uh, even moving further to say, I'd like to be a part of staff meetings. The great part with some of the Google environments is building the opportunity to build that even further. Get out and be visible within schools, listen to staff um, within departments and schedule that and, and make sure that um, it's purposeful. It allows that environment of knowing who we are, what I am, what our next steps, our priorities, and also allowing that feedback of what's happening in that temperature gauge. So as we start looking at that, um, you know, our, our board committees, I've had the opportunity to jump in and be a part of board committees and, and not only introduce myself, but also listen, um, listen to who's involved, what's happening, what are our priorities, what's coming back, and continue that into the spring. And, and then lastly, I think a, a little bit of what we've done in the past, but really reinventing it as a whole entire system. Really looking at engaging a 360 survey. A 360 survey is about growth. It's about getting feedback of our priorities, of what we value and what we're doing, where we're spending our time, to allow us to reflect on where are we and where we're going. Um, what can we do differently? It's a growth mindset in that piece. And really looking at a whole system. So starting with myself, cabinet members, directors, coordinators, principals, and schools. So really starting to see where that looks now. And you know, I think if you're gonna say this, you model it. So my 360 be one of the first to go out and starting in February, January and February, and working with cabinet. And then obviously, as we said, EDOS, directors, coordinators, um, getting feedback from those who we work with and serve to see what we're doing well, ideas that what we can do better, um, and start to put an action plan forward towards that. You know, along with, with that piece, when we work with uh, culture, it's also how do we work with our board? As 
interim superintendent or long-term superintendent. You're balancing how you interact with your community, with your staff, and also with your board. So how I engage with you in working, how do we facilitate quality meetings, setting up quality agendas, topics, and making sure that we present to minimize questions, to minimize lack of knowledge and understanding, and then to offer up how do we make this more visible. It's working to, to have strong communication, updates, timely, urgency, uh, not hopefully minimizing surprises. Uh, work sessions to allow not just presentations, but opportunities to dive in for understanding, dive in for analysis, and really working on what's actually happening for understanding and dialogue and moving that forward. And then how we start to say uh, within this, that strategic plan our action steps. Uh, in, our, in our board meetings to come, really painting the picture of where are we with the strategic plan. We've been working on it, but really showing you what have we accomplished, reviewing and evaluating with our team leaders. And we need to have new team leaders now. We have new people and different people. Uh, what are our next steps? What are our priorities? And when are we gonna accomplish that with those action plans? You know, uh, COVID's still a part of it. We have changed mid-year in October. Uh, we have changed in leadership and we're managing a pandemic. So how we continue to, to lead and give updates around these constant changes and what's impacting us. That has to be a part of this piece. Uh, so increasing that communication, hopefully having a clear plan and communicating that, creating understanding and also creating that feedback. And as we start looking at it, uh, really developing that, that organizational system, a communication plan, what does this look like? What are our norms? How do we generate feedback? And also how do we disseminate quality information and clarity of information? So as we look at that, I think that's an important piece. The last part of, of really saying, if we want to improve and, and really emphasize your climate and culture, we need to tie it back to what we're already doing. The strategic plan is a critical component we want to keep. Not only do we want to keep it, we want to make it more powerful. The work is already happening. Uh, our curriculum instruction assessment department, as we combine those things uh, within it, is very purposeful. It's gonna go into our next uh, goal of what are we doing? How do we use the strategic plan to identify gaps? When we see those gaps, how do we then address it? We're doing great things, but we also need to assess what do we need to do next and what do we need to do better? So that's a key piece for me. If you don't have the relationships, climate culture, it's gonna be hard to get to the other areas. So these are key action statements of how you can start to improve that. There's a lot more detail, but hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea of, of what that value is, who the groups are that I need to make sure I engage with well, and some of the ideas and steps of what I've already taken and what I'm gonna continue and start to build in. A second goal, obviously, uh, is, a, is a primary focus. Student learning, teaching and learning. You know, we've done a lot of talking over this past semester of, of managing COVID and what's the impact. But really what I'd like to see is an emphasis of what's really most important, how do we spend our time there? And that's around uh, academic excellence. Again, aligned with our strategic plan. So it's perfectly fit within the goal, the end statements, board focus, and our work uh, within the strategic plan. And I called it out here just to give that example. Within this focus, I really wanna narrow. We can do a lot of everything and maybe not do it very well. I really want to see us to focus on if we're going to work on teaching and learning and student achievement and growth, we need to focus on professional learning communities. How do we engage our teachers? What do our teachers need? How do they share their best ideas? How do we support them? We have started that work, but we really want to now say this is our priority. How do we drive our time within our schools, within our regional time, our level time, to make the PLCs better understood? provide training and PD to have outcomes, to have uh, processes in which you run, to use data protocols, to look at individual students and groups of students and to share ideas. That's the essence of teaching and that's where we need to spend our time in the spring because that's what we all want to do. So how do we re-engage with that and make it purposeful and make it a priority? Around those same things, it fits within uh, the board's focus. We'll be sharing out more on, on what are our priority student data. Um, in the next slide, you'll see where we are, I am starting to narrow us down. But we need to define what is most important to us. How do we make that actionable? How do we measure and set those goals? So I think those things around um, the work of schools, and that's our entire district's work of how do we focus on that and spend our time and resources to maximize that. 
and really get into then what's our work towards us. We need to align our data protocols to really say where are we, to segregate data. What are we doing well? What do we need to address and improve? How do we do that? And then how do we create the systems to really uh, drive that work purposefully? So we look at it. We have great iReady data. We're gonna be sharing some of this, but we need to systematize and even improve that around what is our data telling us? I'm a firm believer, literacy is key. A goal is to have every student walk out of Douglas County as a strong reader, writer, speaker. So what's that look like within our ready? Well, that's great data points, but driving back to PLC of what's happening in our classrooms. What are our grade level expectations? How do we monitor progress and see improvement? When we see gaps or needs, how do we address that and help instruction and learning progress on those key areas? Read Act was gonna be a presentation night. It would have fit naturally. There's state drives towards the Read Act, and our work here in the next year needs to be focused on reading. Reading leads also naturally into writing. They complement each other. They go hand in hand, yet they're also very different. Reading is measured on a number of assessments statewide that you can drive down on top of building and classroom. Writing's a little di bit different. Writing is not necessarily measured at your state testing, but we have great protocols, but we need to systematize those. Some of these goals are one year, and honestly driving out to be three year, five year. And as you talk about the long-term superintendent, my goal is to have goals that last far beyond me regardless of the timing. It's the right work. Literacy, reading, writing, numeracy are the key things. Fundamental in education, transfer over to every content area, and it's PK-12. Okay, this is driven systematically. So when we look at this, you get into a little bit of the things that we want to break into. We want to not only look at our, our long-term goals in reading, but also what are our gaps? Where are our kids? Where are our kids now? And what can we do immediately? But then also what are our long-term uh, data showing us? What's the success over time? And what's the success after high school? So I think some of these things hopefully get into the piece of aligning our protocols, working within our data, working on teaching and learning is our priority, narrowing it to reading, writing, numeracy, then English language arts. And as we get into this a little more, our re reading progress monitoring PK-8. We have data within iReady, we have state data that focuses just on reading. As we get into the high school level, there's times where we don't think about literacy, but it's purposeful. Students that struggle in science or social studies, a lot of times it goes back to the reading. You read to think. So we think about what are those soft skills? And the soft skills go hand in hand, but when you go down to what are we gonna measure and what are our deliverables, what do we wanna focus, I would like to simplify. Again, a lot of these other things we will be doing, but to call it as our priorities and put our time and resources and how it impacts others and the ripple effect magnifies all those other uh, qualities which help our kids be successful. You know, we wanna look at, uh, uh, as we look at our pretty reading protocols, what are we doing well? What are we already doing? What do we need to do next? And provide guidance and information. Share within those PLCs of what is evidence-based. Really taking a look at our writing strategies. There's a lot of data that we have on reading. How do we know where we are with writing? What's grade level? And how do we kind of do, in a sense, an audit? What are we doing? What resource do we have? Um, do we have rubrics or assessments that are common? Do we have common ideas of grade level proficiencies and advancements? We have a number of our schools that help kids be at least a grade level ahead. But how do we really make that known and understood? How do we quantify that and celebrate that and also help all kids access that? The same is true as we look at uh, our, our matriculation pattern. So as we start talking about this, while you look at an elementary level, this matriculates PK-12. So reading, writing, it's a part of everything we do. How do we help with instructional practices as it gets in the upper levels? as it gets to content areas, as it gets into CTE programming or concurrent enrollment program, I think all of this helps to look at a focus of reading, writing, and numeracy throughout. And when we talk about um, the, the numeracy side, we can take a look at grade levels, algebra one skills. We have a strong pattern of, of looking at algebra one as a, as a gatekeeper. We can push to say, how do we help all and more of our kids be more successful, be algebra one successful, complete coming out of middle school? 
whether it be seventh grade, eighth grade, and then what that looks like with key skills moving down throughout your PK elementary. How do we then look at that Algebra One success moving into our, our high school courses? Um, that helps us not only with state testing, ACT, SAT, which is um, a value to high school students, a value to get into universities, a value to get scholarships, but also a value to be successful. If you are college driven, you can be successful um, in other aspects, whether it be industry, military, uh, and employment. So I think on those things, when we talk about those skills of content on top of skills of readiness, that's gonna be important. So as we start looking at the numeracy side, um, again, when we look at this, the strategic plan, this goes back a little bit to the other piece. The strategic plan has already, already identified some gaps. We do a pretty good job with equity. It is a key focus. We talk about it a lot, it's in our strategic plan. As we dive into the strategic plan, we've already noticed, we need to really capitalize on what does this mean? What's our common language? What are the actions? And then where's our intentional leadership around equity? Everyone's trying to do it, but one of the things we're starting to notice and we, we're identifying we need to figure out action steps to move forward is what are our next steps to take this to the next level? You know, the good to great schemes of how do we do this better? And equity is one of those topics that we've already identified. And that really kind of leads us into uh, a couple other uh, steps that I'll combine. When you look at academic excellence, it's not just the academic side. How do you create well-being of all? So when you look at the social emotional components, when you look at the mental health, it's really starting to drive what are those next steps that are systematic. We have school-based interventions, we have resources, but how do we look at all those that are common? What do we ensure that we're doing in, in every school at different grade levels, whether it be daily or weekly and start to implement and have a system in which we know what we're doing and why. We know how to respond, we're proactive, and really putting those things in place. You know, we talk about, we have trauma-informed PD, how do we make sure we're ensuring that, that it's available, accessible, but then also we know that it's given and used. When we look at the mindfulness strategies, we have a lot available, but how do we ensure these are being used everywhere and that they're available, accessible, and known? And so deepening the, those PD strategies on top of the implementation process. And lastly, it kind of gets me to goal number three. You know, you, you're in a process where we're transitioning superintendents. I'm an interim superintendent. I need to help Douglas County be better when I leave, no matter when that is, than when I took this role over. We're doing a lot of great things. There's a lot of success. But I think when you look at a, an interim is my job is to help us through this year for sure. That's what I can control. I want to build this for further. But in this, what does that mean? As we took, we need to get more feedback. Where are we? My visibility isn't just to be visible. It's to listen. It's to engage. It's to bring back ideas and next steps. A 360, it's not just to inform myself on my own work. It's to inform us and all of us of how we can be better. What are our next steps? What are we noticing? What are our strengths? What are our gaps? Creating an action plan and pulling that together and creating an action plan of what are those next steps for our district. And that's short term and long term. How do we address it immediately? But then how do we plan this out for the future of Douglas County? As I said, you know, we've already started the work. As you look at our teams on the strategic plan, the action plans, as you look at the themes of the strategic plan and you look at it, equities being addressed. But there's still a lot we need to do and how do we do it better? We have a new SBB coming out which is addressing some of the equity needs. We need to continue to monitor that. What's working with that? How do we have tweaks? How do we make it better? Are there roles and leadership capacity that we need to build with an equity? Are there roles that we don't have? We've taken assessment department and our curriculum instruction department. And for this year, we've merged that. It's not rocket science. It's what our district has done in the past. It's what other districts do. But we're merging that to be more efficient, to be more effective, to maximize our people and resources uh, in our system and also out to our schools. That could create the opportunity to grow in a position to address equity and to make it daily in all of our work in which we talk about. So I think that's something that, that um, it's, a, it's a piece that we are looking at and looking at where all of our people fall within our departments, that flow chart of work, maximizing our resources and driving for the future. Common sense, but more focused and purposeful. 
You know, last, as you heard, and we talked about a little bit, it fits well within the goals. We need to make sure our, our financial stability is in place. We need to make sure that our, our district budgets are understood. Our current state of our finances within the community is understood. Our needs are better called out. How we address those needs are put into a, a format that can move us forward to, to accomplish that. Whether it be a bond mill, whether it be reconfiguring, um, how we spend our money and where we spend our time. And I think some of the things that we've done is we've started to put that forward and making our budget much more known in the fall. It's gonna be carried forward uh, to our board and our board meetings, to our community, and to our, our departments and schools to understand our budget, to put together our priorities. And then lastly within that, um, you know, part of my job is gonna be continuing to lead us through COVID. There's managerial parts, but there's also leadership to where I, would not, I don't want us to spend our time just on COVID. We're doing a lot of the work, but we need to call out where we spend our time in our meetings, where we spend our time in our schools, and where we even spend our time as, as a district leadership and board around teaching and learning, what's most important. So I think in that piece, um, we're gonna manage it. As I said earlier, I think we have a solid plan that can continue to lead us to adapt and respond to flex, um, and that's gonna be part of this work uh, for an interim. And I think that's uh, something that I need to do well um, as an entire district. And it's not just about me, it's about everyone else around me extending that piece. Uh, so, three goals. As you get to know me, I'm pretty detailed that, that one goal incorporates many things. I have lofty uh, expectations of myself and of all of us around me, and, uh, and I tried to be brief in explanation, but I can answer and have a lot more detail uh, uh, within these goals, but I wanted to make sure that there is clarity, but also to be concise in uh, what I'm working towards. Uh, so you have an understanding so our system has the understanding of our community. So what questions do you have for me? First of all, I'm exhausted just thinking about all the things you're planning to do in the next six months, Mr. Wise. Um, really very um, lofty goals in some ways, but also as you st have presented, very much in aligned with our priorities, with the strategic plan themes, uh, everything you can see how everything comes together. So applause first of all, to all the work that you've done to kind of think through this. Board directors, the reason this is critical for us too is I think that it focuses us. Um, our interim superintendent is our technically our number one employee that we supervise, that we oversee, that we provide input and direction to. So what this does really is it also defines our work in terms of what our focus will be. And, and I want to really stress that because I think we tend to be a board that tends to like to do a lot of idea generating. Um, and I think perfect example was the, the peer tutor program, which I think is valid and worthwhile to explore. However, when we adopt these goals, I think it narrows our focus to say, let's make sure this is the stuff that we're focused on because otherwise we can really do a number on the system to say, oh, by the way, Corey, we, st we also want you to do this too. So this really is our opportunity to say, has he nailed it in terms of what we want to be focused on for the next six months? And if so, we've got to be prepared to hear, you know what, board, that's not part of the map that Corey has put out for us in terms of the areas that he's focused on, so we really need to rein ourselves in, if that makes sense. So that's, that's just an editorial of the importance of what we're about to do and how it should impact our work for the next uh, five months. With that, are there questions to Mr. Wise regarding the areas he's focused on or any things that you're concerned about or things that you feel like are missing, um, what questions do you have? Director Graziano? Um, yeah, thanks, Interim Superintendent Wise for this, great. My, my question is, that's a lot. So, you know, do you, do you feel comfortable with, with all of that? Clip you must, but I mean, presenting all of that and you think it's reasonable to, um, to deliver on it? Because, you know, one of the, it's one thing to say, 
to have all these goals and, and outline them on a piece of paper. It's another thing to deliver. So I guess I really just want to hear from you a gut check if this is what you've laid out in the time frame. Do you think it's feasible? Yeah. So when you talk about time frame, I think some of the direct goals, you're going to see immediate impact and immediate uh, action. I think some of these are going to have to be what we don't have in place. We're able to call out and start putting those actions together. So some of them might be starting points. We talked about writing. Writing is happening, but where's our system of writing? I think we need to do an assessment. We need to ask what we're already doing. And that's a goal that I think I can accomplish, but there's not an ending point. So some of these are going to be continuous of work. And honestly, I think need to be, they're part of our strategic plan. It's going to be driving our work regardless of who and when. And I think part of these goals are, are what are actionable now, what's going to be accomplished to report out, and then what's our continuing work and having a clear plan so it's understood. So the simplicity of some of it is what I value. It's fundamental. It's keystone. It's most important. It's priorities. But I'd also say some of it's going to be um, one-year, three-year, five-year plan, not only of myself, but of our district. So, yeah, it's, you know what, the goals I put on myself and believing in this district and who we are, uh, I feel comfortable. I'm going to ask the question a little bit differently because I think Director Graziano is on to something as far as, you know, we, we have a mindset of the SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, uh, timely, relevant, I think, you know, is, is that acronym. So when we get to a point in time where we're saying, okay, we're going to evaluate you, are all these things that you want us to evaluate, or are there things that you would say, I definitely know, like you said, there's a three to five year kind of spread in some of these in your mind. Are there some goals at the, at, in May that you say, yeah, the, these definitely are ones that I want you to evaluate me in terms of accomplishing because it's specific and it's measurable? So again, I think I'm going to put myself out there. Yeah, I think uh, evaluating me on these, absolutely. Okay. I think at the same time, we're going to be bringing where we are. And part of the evaluation is being vulnerable enough to say, this is what we've accomplished. This is where we're going next. Um, if it's not a priority, then why would it be on there? So I, I think on that piece that we need to drive the right work, narrow the focus, and create steps in a pathway. Um, I will. I will be humble enough to say to say you're going to accomplish and hit hit uh, reading, writing, math, and having all the systems in place of action, especially in a year of COVID. But boy, if we aren't spending the time on that, starting to find that and evaluate it and set up steps on top of showing what we've accomplished. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, again, as we get to May, I think we're going to have to call it. I think even can goals I, are a continuation. But I think we're going to have to call out what are we trying to accomplish, what's that look like. But I can put out examples of what we're doing and give measurables, uh, I think, towards these. And they're big. So I, just, Graziano, go ahead. I just want to, it goes back to me, like things that are being time bound, right? couple of things you mentioned had long windows out into, you know, one, three, five years. So while that's certainly reasonable that we should have uh, things that we're tackling like that, as it relates to um, looking at how well you're doing your, this role here in this period, um, I, I think having too many things like that will be, will make things fuzzy. I'd rather have, you know, to me, I think some of it needs to be very clear that what's up through a certain period of time yeah. versus can just go on. Because I think that could do you a disservice or it just like gets us, puts us in a, a, a bad spot because yeah. we've started something that we're, you know, maybe we're not going to pursue. So I think having some of these more time bound would be something I'd like to see. Yep. And I think that's part of my go work, I have more to find out what that looks like over time, so I can call that out more uh, explicitly. I will say this, reading's our focus right now. Reading's our focus on a number of things. You look at read, act, and priority, uh, we need to have that for our teachers. Um, when you talk about, for lack of a better word, killing you know, multiple words with one stone, it's multiple actions that are prioritized right now by the state and by a value that we have. So reading as a priority in that work over writing is a key. Writing over time, we're going to do, 
and how we measure that in a plan over time, to set a plan and have an action to do an audit will be steps to build that. So I agree with you on that side that I can call that a little better of a smart piece of what we're gonna accomplish over a short period of time and this one semester, to be quite honest. Yep. Other questions, directors? Director Holtzman? And then I see Director Long and Director Cross, uh, Chantra, sorry, Director Holtzman, go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you for all of this work, just to put this together. And I, I echo what they said. There's a lot on here, um, and it, it looks great. I, I also kind of understand what they're saying, and I'm going to try to articulate it in, in the way that it makes sense to me. Um, when I look at the safe, positive culture and climate goal, and I look at all the things that you've listed that you will do, it makes sense to me that if you do those things, there'll be an improvement in culture and climate. And I could foresee that there'd be an easy way to measure current state and a later state by you know, maybe taking community surveys or perhaps using some of these 360 surveys. So, so I can foresee that we could measure that goal and that by what you've laid out. When I look at the academic goal, um, it gets a little bit fuzzier to me um, in terms of I would love for us to be able to say, here's where we are currently, sort of like you said with the writing. I think you called it an audit for writing. Um, only at a kind of higher level. I guess for me, there's so many details in that academic excellence um, equity goal. And I so appreciate that you want to do every one of them. But as a board member, I think what would be helpful to us is to have kind of a more higher level of here's what we currently have in terms of school-based interventions that are working. Here's the curriculum resources that we have. And here's what we need. And I'm not saying that it has to be equal at every school, but f figuring out from the performance data that you're going to bring us to where we need to make changes. Um, to be equitable, to have opportunities, you know, where we have opportunities that we need to have in other places. So a kind of current state audit and a what's needed. For instance, when it comes to an MLO, we really need this program at this other school, but we don't have the money for it kind of thing. And then the second point would just be when you're talking about um, a lot of details about assessments. I think it's so important for you all as experts to evaluate that. For me as a board member, I, I would love it if it could be, and for a community member, if it could be a little more simple and just be like, here's where we are now in all the areas, cognitive, physical, like health and fitness, and social, emotional. And, and here's where we are the next time we measure it. And I'm sure that you can do that. And it's probably easier for an expert educator to look at that list and know how that happens. Um, but just want you to know that's what I'm going to look for. Like that higher level, here's where we are, and here's where we're going kind of thing. So. Very good thing, Director Holtzman. Director Long, go ahead. And I, and I see Mr. Weiss is taking copious notes. And we'll kind of come back to you and just kind of summarize where where you feel you are with the input and reaction we've given you. Director Long, go ahead. Actually, Dr. Chang Xiu saw raise her hand earlier than I do, but if you want, I can go ahead first. Otherwise, I'll let her go first. Director Long, I called on you, so if you would please okay, go. Okay, sure. Yes, I said, let's go. You know, I can dying to say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and again, I appreciate, you know, uh, interim superintendents, uh, uh, you know, thoughtful and detailed plan that give to us. Um, but quite honestly, um, I have been a business owner that derived more than 30 employees, and I was a Boeing, manage, Boeing subsidiary manager that I do a lot of derivation before. That's just not quite what I'm looking for for smart um, derivations. I, I reveal um, former interim superintendent Aaron King's um, derivations. Um, that one is much more sweet and salt and, and, and short and up to the pond. Um, by the way, I want to thank, you know, former interim super, superintendents uh, and King's service. Um, and so uh, and I compared that one and this one, um, especially, I'm not going to repeat what the other director said about the other topics, but just looking at the financial piece, the goal three, 
I just don't see how I can uh, do a measurable um, on that particular two uh, bullet point. Um, I personally are looking for something a little bit more um, concise and uh, measurable. After all, um, I wish you luck, you know, of, of applying for a per permanent positions, but your durations is only up to uh, June 30th. And um, currently what we have at the moment, from my point of view, is not clear and concise enough to, to do you any justice, quite honestly. Thank you. All right, thank you, Director Long. Director Chancho Shore. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Weiss, as an educator, I can see exactly where you're going. Um, I see that you're thinking about current state and you're thinking about next steps to desired state. Um, as a board member, I was, I would only add that what Director Holtzman identified as important steps to call out for equity purposes in our special populations was what I was going to elaborate on and I don't need to repeat what she said. She said it very well. My only comment, thank you. All right, thank you, Director Chancho Shore. Any other comments, Director Meek? So thank you again for all of the work on this. It's very detailed. Um, and I kind of feel like it goes into more of the how. And it's maybe what we've already said. Like the one question I had is what data will we use to measure the results? And I do think the 360 survey is a great start. But we also have other populations like students and parents and community. Um, honestly, for safe positive culture and climate, just establishing base data, getting that done <laughs> in the next six months um, would be, I think, a huge advancement. Um, when it comes to the academic excellence piece, the social emotional learning and mindfulness with teachers, I mean, really, it's like, what data are we going to use? Um, and there are data points through climate and culture surveys where students have an adult that they trust or a mentor or they have experiential learning or, you know, there are different points that I think we can get to. And so for me as a board member, I'm just sitting here trying to think, how are we going to track progress and get baseline data? And I don't think we can track progress. I think we just have to start with baseline data so that we can then move forward um, in a systemic way, measuring the system's progress. Um, but those were really my high level comments. So one of the questions I have, um, directors, so as far as baseline data and monitoring progress, we have a vehicle in terms of monitoring reports for the system is going to do that through Corey's leadership, of course, but the system is going to do that. So I guess in my own mind, I'm trying to distinguish between superintendent behavior and performance and system performance, because we've already set up, we've already got the structure set up for monitoring reports. We will get data that says, here's where they started, here's where we're going based on our board emphases that we approved already. These things, though, are specific to how he behaves, how he performs, what he does. So I think that's one of the distinctions I, I think I would challenge us all as we're kind of rocking through this is what's going to come up in our monitoring reports and that superintendent evaluation is a little different. Uh, Director Meek? Yeah, so I think about this ad nauseum. <laughs> and I don't know if I have the answers or not, other than like when I read policy governance, our policy governance, it talks about we evaluate the superintendent based on the system's performance. Right. Like true policy governance systems, all they do is they look at successful completion of monitoring reports, because that is the superintendent being successful. And I know we're trying to get started with our monitoring reports. And so for me, I would just love to see us 
get started in establishing that system that would allow us to be successful. Yeah. No, I agree. I th and I think that is the dilemma is that the modern report is, as you have said, from policy governance is what we evaluate. This is kind of the, an additional lens that says, what is the superintendent doing? You know, and, and you're right. This, this is not necessarily policy governance. I mean, it's, it's aligned to all the emphases. It's aligned to all the monitoring. So anything that's in here, we should see come out in our monitoring reports. But are there things that are unique to the interim superintendent that, we, that he should focus on above and beyond just providing us the monitoring report data? That's kind of the question I have. Um, otherwise, we, we just made him go through this effort. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> if we just work on the same mod reports. Can I throw out measurables? Sure. So when you look at actions, part of these goals of being visible and, and attending things um, is a clear statement of what I feel might have been, might be needed. Okay? So um, what was attended and what's attended now? Feedback from not only being there, but what purpose did that serve? Um, what took place because of that? Part of my monitoring report of saying my visibility and being at these steps is say what came from it, um, what impact that did that have? So part of my reporting out is, is one, I can show measurables of what I'm at. Then I can also show what resulted from that. Some of it will be very objective in a SMART goal. Some of it will also then be um, what's the result of that um, and impact of that. So I think, I will say this, um, being engaged in the principals meetings, the feedback I'm getting from our principals is they value that. Having a superintendent there listening, sharing, creating a good plan, communicating that piece is needed. Um, and I do think it's measurable. So when you go back to the smart goals of how do I put that in place, I've been at every meeting and engaged in every principal meeting, level meeting, uh, elementary, middle school, high school, and serving that role, and I think adding to that role. So for what it's worth in a different framework of putting that to smart, of actionable, um, making sure that, that I follow through, that accountability side of measure, that I follow through, that I don't just start it and not finish it, but complete those things, and show that impact. Because um, I do believe the first thing in climate culture is being visible, being with people, listening, sharing, and I do think we can, now I can pare this down a little bit, but I do think increasing that communication, showing what communication was there and where it is now, how much of it, is it quality, how are we changing that communication, improving it, right. um, but I do think some of these could be measurable, but I can pare it down also, but um, the and student achievement one, I agree with you on, there's some difficulty in some of that. We probably do need to get some current states, some baseline. Um, we will be monitoring out and showing that side. Uh, that can be direct, immediate, but also what's needed. The budget side, going back to Director Lung's question, you know, the budget one's interesting because it's, it's, it's a, it is a long going piece, but I think having, disseminating information, ensuring the budget regularly, um, each board meeting, adding that piece in the fall has been a change. It's been an addition, improving to have more mechanisms to show the budget throughout the spring and decision-making process and understanding of it. Uh, could be measured in the amounts and then also the understanding and impact of, of helping decision-making on that. But that, that might be one also that we can eliminate or make more concise. But possible measures, when I put those actions, is to measure the action. Yeah, I, th I, think you're, I think that was a perfect example of the difference between what it is you do, Mr. Wise, and what is it that we do with the monitoring reports. So perfect example of I attend all the level meetings. That probably doesn't necessarily come up in a monitoring report uh, because when we're judging climate and culture, like <coughs> Director Holtzman suggests, we're looking at kind of a pre and post. You know, here's how I felt. And all of a sudden now here, I'm feeling better about working in the system. That's the monitoring report. The Mr. Wise report is, I'm going to be at every level meeting. I'm going to have all these town halls. You know, the, so that, I think that's kind of, in my mind, the difference with these goals that differentiate from the monitoring reports is these are, these are unique to you, Corey Wise. What are your actions? Not what is the system doing, 
although the actions that you are taking will inspire the system and activate the system and move the system, these are, I think these are personal to you. What are you doing to help the monitoring reports be accomplished as well as showing, helping the monitoring reports realize the things we're looking for, which is that pre and post way of assessing the system's work? I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else, but it just seems like to me that's where we're getting stuck is we're trying, we're trying to take on the whole system here when we really are just wanting to say, Corey, what are you gonna do? What's your, what's your action? What's your responsibilities? And in, in how do you fit into the system? Does that make sense? And to be quite honest, you're evaluating me on a lot more than these three goals. You have a system to evaluate me. This is primary focus aligned to your goals in statement strategic plan of how am I gonna help accomplish our work, right. my work, yep. Well, and actually Director Meek is correct, is that by our policy governance, no. We don't have to evaluate you any further than the monitoring reports. Okay. If the monitoring reports are successful, check, you are successful in our system. Um, so we have chosen past practice because we tend to do things differently is we tend to do this kind of work with our superintendent to say, we wanna develop you as a leader superintendent. So what are the things that you're gonna to do to develop yourself as a leader? What are the things you're gonna to do to make, to add value to the system? Um, that's been past practice. I'm not saying that's correct, but that's what we've done in the past. So that's, I think, what we're, what we're trying to get through. Uh, Director Chancha Shore, go ahead. Might not be a very popular statement, but boy, we are forever powerful. Um, it, helping our superintendents grow. <laughs> what I'm really wanting to comment on is what I feel like was presented to us. And, and it, tell me if I'm wrong. These are the things in the next several months that you intend to do, Corey, as interim superintendent to, to acquire some baseline information and develop next steps for the system um, to put some strategic, uh, let's put some things in place strategically so that our system moves forward. And evaluating you on the specifics of the goals, it's, it's lofty and it's important. As you said, all those things are really important. And they should be going on because it's a school district. So it's not like you're taking on a bunch of new stuff that school districts don't do. You're taking on what school districts do and presenting the data and information to continue to move us forward. So I guess that's my comment is that's how I see it. Is that what you're seeing also or are you seeing it differently? No, that's how I'm seeing it. And maybe a little more focus, but yes. So, board, any other feedback, first of all, and um, I'm wondering if what we're suggesting, Mr. Wise, give you a chance to kind of pare some things down, more concise, more measurable for what the next five months are for you, um, and giving yourself permission that you don't have to include every single thing in here um, like you have, because all these are great priorities, they're, they're great for our system. But I'm wondering, is that where we are, directors? Would we like Mr. Wise to come back with kind of a pared down version of these? I see a thumbs up from Director Lung. Other thoughts in terms of next steps? Director Holtzman? I mean, I appreciate this discussion because, you know, we haven't um, done monitoring reports in a while in this district. And um, we have been evaluating superintendents, but I think this is helping us as a board, better define, and I agree with Director Meek that you know, the evaluation of the superintendent is the evaluation of the district. It's the same thing in policy governance. So, so I'm left to have a lot to think about. But um, I, you know, I think what we're really asking him to do, I, I think he's kind of identified his values, like Director Chancho Shore said. He's He's identifying what he thinks is valuable that he needs to do in a district that's not something that's not done in other districts, but these are the things that he thinks will help lead us to the, the end result we're looking for. So I'm just trying not to create more work 
um, for our interim <laughs> superintendent that doesn't need to be done. So I'm just, I'm just wondering if, you know, these are the values and the things he's identified. Um, I don't have input on changing them. I just do have input on as we evaluate as a board, we do evaluate based on the system. So I think that when I was giving feedback, it was more feedback to say, these are all great, but kind of just remember that in the end, that's how we'll actually measure you is based on the system performance. So that I think that's kind of what we were all saying is, yep. these are great, we just need to be able to see this. Is that Make sense? Sure. So you might advocate that we just acknowledge that these are the priorities and values of our interim superintendent, but that we stay with the peer model of the monitoring reports are ultimately what will determine your evaluation at the end of the year. Is that, I mean, is that what you're advocating, possibly? I mean, I think so. I'm just trying to think about, you know, the most effective use of our leaders time and yep. um, I think I think that's what I'm asking for. All right. Other thoughts? Good director Lung. Well again, the superintendent is the boss only employee and uh, he's the most important person and, and to uh, make sure that there's a very clear goal for him is equally important so that he's focused on the things that the board treasure the most. I see some of the stuff over there is the day-to-day -day, um, job descriptions of the superintendents, where it's just being put it down um, over there for what a superintendents are, are supposed to do. You know, I mean, every day, effective BOE meeting facilitations, regular update, or budget and things like that. That's not goal. That, that is, that is what you know, an employee is supposed to do. So, so I, I look at this a little bit, you know, differently. Um, I personally cannot support um, this as it is, um, without a clear and concise um, accomplishment that he want to make and how we measure it. Thank you. Okay, other thoughts? And again, so we've got two conflicting thoughts. One is let's stick with our governance model that says progress monitoring is what will determine how we evaluate our superintendent. And the other is, as Director Lung is advocating, is that we get our superintendent to set some very specific measurable goals um, beyond just listing job description type items. What's some other thoughts? Director Graziano? I, I'll just say I, I, I understand completely where Director Long is coming from. And that's kind of where I started when I, my initial comment was around, can, you know, how are we gonna track and do all this? Having listened to the conversation, knowing the situation that we're trying to we're in where our focus is trying to return to school and keep in a safe and healthy environment. And knowing that we overstep our bounds sometimes, <laughs> um, I, 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 I am more of agreement of, of let's support, let the governance model support the actions here and, and take a step back. And that's how we'll determine if interim superintendent wise is, is doing the job we'd like him to do. So that's, that, all right, thank you, Director Graziano. Any other, any other thoughts or comments? Director Meek? I'm not sure we gave Mr. Wise an opportunity to reflect back, and I think I'd, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are because that would guide my thinking as well. Yeah, and I, I, wanna, and I did that intentionally okay. because um, he is our employee. We determine how he gets evaluated, and so we don't, necessarily ask him, how do you want to be evaluated? We, we have to be the ones that get clear, otherwise we put him through a lot of hoops that aren't necessary. So, so I do want to give him I'll, time to reflect. I can share my opinion. Like, I feel like this isn't what we should be asking our superintendent. Like, this is the how. And I feel like our job is to be looking at our goals, thinking, how are we going to measure this? 
And are there actions listed on here that help us measure it effectively? But this gives a lot more detail than I feel like we need necessarily. So that's my opinion on this. Any other directors? Director Hanson, I haven't heard from you, so I'm gonna ask you to weigh in. Well, I um, probably tend to fall with Director Graziano. And when we initially began our discussion, I, um, I am just more accustomed to a, a performance evaluation that has very specific and measurable criteria. Um, I think that we need to, we've said this several times, but we either need to follow policy governance or we need to change the, the governance model that we use. And I think that we need to um, stick with policy governance unless we're going to change that. And like has been said before, um, this is what, this, what, what, um, Mr. Wise has presented is, is essentially policy governance. And um, I think we need to give him a chance. I think that um, he has a, a team of people that are um, truly wanting to work with him. And I think we'll be amazed at what he will be able to accomplish from this list, even though it is very extensive. So I would um, just like to evaluate the superintendent on the performance of the district as a whole. And I think that the criteria that he's laid out is a really good um, tool for that. Dr. Holtzman? So I would only say that um, going this route you know, we still don't really know what we're going to be expecting in a monitoring report. Um, so I think we've all kind of said what we're looking for, but we still don't really know what we're gonna get. And so I guess, you know, that is one drawback, but. So that's true, we, we missed that time where we really were going to determine the format of a monitoring report and come to some agreement and we haven't uh, done that, although Mr. Wise certainly has done some preliminary work with helping us know how they interpret the goals that we've emphasized, as well as some suggestions for what kind of data he, the system is going to collect to show progress is being made. So, um, so yes, we've got a couple of uh, unknowns that make this even more challenging. Um, so, I guess, to summarize, I think what we're saying is this has been a good exercise, Mr. Wise, in terms of us being able to get a picture in your mind in terms of the work that you're valuing, the, the, the I think Sue, the Director Meek said, the how of your job. I mean, it's, it's very clear to me the things that you're going after. And so I think from that aspect, it's been a good exercise for us to have that prioritized. Um, but I think you can see that we've got some different opinions in terms of what, how we might move forward. Um, I see the majority of us, I believe, would say, let's maintain our focus on really nailing down what a monitoring report should look like and use that as the tool, the ultimate tool, to summarize your performance for this year. Um, and so I'm gonna see if that sticks or not, but I do wanna give you a chance to reflect to see how you feel about that. If, if we, because we're right, because this we, we have not spent time to really develop a structure for what we're expecting from the monitoring reports. And that's our fault, it's not your fault, but it certainly would behoove us to get clear as we move into having a permanent superintendent so that that becomes part of our way of doing business. So, I'm going to suggest where we are is that we move forward with really honing in on, spending some, some good time on developing our format for the monitoring report, coming to an agreement, and using that as our tool to summarize Mr. Wise's performance at the end of the year. Uh, that's gonna be my recommendation. Mr. Wise, um, and, I, and then I'm gonna see if that sticks. We'll, we'll put that out as a motion in just a moment. But before I do that, Mr. Wise, do you want to now reflect on this conversation? 
Yeah, I'm comfortable with the monitor reports. I also can pare this down into one, two to three SMART goals. So in that process, really paring this down to a SMART goal, if that's what's wanted uh, in that piece, similar to a, a monitoring report, but to pare it down to a specific action and measurables, I can do that too. So I'm good either way. Okay, so I'm gonna entertain a motion of what, how we move forward with the interim superintendent goals in terms of how we wanna move forward. Director Holtzman? Um, so I just need clarification on, on what you were saying. Um, can, you, can you repeat the last, <laughs> yeah. last suggestion you made? I just kind of need to think about it. I, th I think uh, we're, we're acknowledging the, the how of the work that Mr. Wise is planning on taking on. We acknowledge that, but then we also are making a commitment to identify the format for our monitoring reports and making a commitment that that becomes our tool for evaluating the superintendent performance in May, as well as in future years to come. And I, I would say that that sounds wonderful, but I will also repeat what I've said before, which is um, we, as board members, are not qualified to develop that format. And I think that's where it's a big circle, and that's kind of where we all started tonight. Like, I really need our staff to develop that format. I am not an expert educator that can um, say and then and now about cognitive, physical, and social emotional. Here's what I measured today, and here's what I measured you know, later. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think it's true. Um, and perhaps then again, what we just need Mr. Wise to do is to actually formulate these smart goals, and then that's our format for our monitoring report. Because I just don't think it's the role of the board to develop that format. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other thoughts. Director Long? Well, we did that before. We, we have a duration criteria for former interim superintendents, um, Aaron King. It's not like we haven't given a goal and, um, and, and ask um, to lay out specific what um, she want to do and how you know, she wants she be measured. And to depends on something that the board has not done, which is the monitoring report for a while to measure um, Mr. Wise, I think it's just not practical or fair. We, most of the times when I'm meeting really late, um, just trying to find a time uh, to talk to um, the, the, the firm who's trying to find superintendents is, is to take an end of Congress to find a time for seven of us. and. and What's the why likely we will get a very good and very uh, concise monitoring report um, to measure him? I just don't know how we could uh, achieve that. I, I just um, I think I still stuck with what I think what a smart is, um, and I think he can uh, refine what he's doing and give us something that is more concise and um, and measurable. Uh, we established a system in here to measuring our superintendents. Um, circumstances is tough, but we shouldn't just let it be because um, because we don't want to. I mean, I thank you. All right, so I'm looking for a motion, board. Um, how we move, move forward? To, move to approve what's been proposed um, by uh, interim superintendent wise. So, so say, say it one more time for me, Director. Move Brown. to approve um, the plan, the goals that have been proposed by interim superintendent wise. Okay, there's been a motion to approve the goals as presented by uh, Mr. Wise tonight. Is there a second? Second. Second by Chancho Shore. All right. Further discussion. Director Chancho Shore. Um, I would just add that I think it is the um, work of the school district to look at what information we would need to monitor the goals that we have set up 
as our, in our strategic plan and as our bold board goals. It isn't the work of the board to come up with what that looks like because that would look different because there are people on the dance floor doing the work and they would be identifying what work they would be doing and we're not on the dance floor. So I would advocate that the school district personnel make a decision and come up with a form that they would present that looks like a monitoring report. And then we could review and preview and make adjustments accordingly. But that's really not the work of a board of education. That's work of a school district. So I would add that also um, a board of education policy governance board um, is in the job of looking at how our school district is functioning from a very high level. And so if we are going to operate at that level, I would agree with Director Meek and Director Holtzman in then let's operate at that level. Um, and we review monitoring notes to look at how our school district is doing as presented by our school district and make adjustments accordingly. So I concur that this is the job of the school district and I concur that um, Mr. Weiss's goals and reflections today, I would hate for him to spend more time refining what he, how he's going to do the work of the monitoring reports and how he's gonna do his daily work. I'd really like to see more time spent in letting him do his daily work instead of trying to appease the board. All right. Any other discussions? So there's, there's been a motion made and seconded to accept the goals as stated by direct or by uh, Mr. Weiss. Any other discussion? Uh, although I, Director Tonshore, you kind of went off into another arena about monitoring reports, which I don't know how that relates. Are you assuming that the goals that have been set here today is the monitoring report is synonymous? No, no. Everybody was talking about. And Director, Director Meek said it best, I think, in monitoring reports are how we are measuring how the district is doing. But the how Corey Weiss is doing in working into those monitoring reports, though she's, it's the how. So let's let that be the how. And he has laid those things out pretty prolifically with lots of information about the steps he's going to take in the next many months. So I was just comparing the, the two are different documents, and I don't really think that they, that one is the how of doing the other. The what, how he would be presenting what he is doing through this goal sheet that he gave us, so leave it there. So there's still, there's still two parallel ways that we're assessing would be these goals plus the monitoring reports. The goals that that Mr. Weiss presented to us, he is giving us, here's what I'm going to be doing. Monitoring reports shows us how our school district is doing, not how how the superintendent is doing that work. Right, right, right. So I can, I'm do not you see what I'm saying or do I need to clarify? No, I'm not questioning your definition. My questioning is if are we gonna maintain this notion that we've got two parallel things going on. One is, is Mr. Weiss's goals as written, and then two is that there's still a monitoring report for the system. So we're still saying we've got two parallel kinds of universes that are going on as far as how we are evaluating the performance of our superintendent as well as the performance of our system. Director Meek? Well, I guess, oh, Director sorry. Ray, the question you are asking is, are we going to be a policy governance board or are we going to get in onto the dance floor? Because that's really, the no. two different questions at this right. point. I'm just trying to clarify what we're voting on. So right now we're voting on the goals that Mr. Weiss has set, but we're also sending a message that there's also this monitoring report that we're still expecting as well. So I'm just trying to clarify what we're voting on tonight. Director Meek? I guess the way I look at it, we have six months that we're looking at and we don't have monitoring reports in place. So I think a realistic goal is is evaluating on these goals while we build out the monitoring reports because that will take a while and the district will create those data points like Director Chancho Shore said. Like we will save the safe, positive culture and climate. We need the monitoring report. 
you'll give us the data. So I think we're voting on evaluating Mr. Weiss based on his proposal here, which we have six months, and we start building out the monitoring reports so we can create that next phase. Thank you. Anybody want to clear? So I'm sorry, uh, Director Long. I saw Director Holtzman. Director Long, go ahead. Well, I want to say this again. The documents as presented is not smart. Many of them are not specific. Many of them are not measurable. Many of them are not attainable. So how are we going to measure him if we approve these documents? Um, I just don't see how we could give an objective measurement while we don't have any objectable, measurable um, items you know, over there. And your voice of disagreement has been heard, but we're right now we've got a motion that says we're accepting the goal statements as written from Mr. Weiss. Mr. Weiss may choose to do some refinement, and he certainly has heard the concern that we'd like to see more measurable kinds of things in these goals, but I think the motion right now is such that we're supposed to simply decide whether to accept it or not. So with that, I'm going to take us to a vote and Director Chancha Shore. Director Graziano. Aye. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Holtzman. Aye. Director Lung. No. Director Meek. Aye. Director Ray is an aye, and so that passes uh, six to one. Good conversation, good discussion, shows you that we've got some future work to do in terms of how we, as a board, receive how the system is doing. So uh, I think it was, was a good conversation. So thank you. All right, last thing are the board reports. And just again, our 12th, our meeting on the 12th at five o'clock, we'll do that remotely. And then also um, agenda planning this Friday at 10 o'clock. Vice President Holtzman, any reports? No, I don't have any, thanks. All right, any other reports from